Welcome everyone. This is our second workshop series of the week featuring David Williams. Let's present David Williams. <laughs> The Legend of Ashtanga Yoga. <laughs> I have a million stories after more than 40 years in yoga world, but the one everybody likes best is the one I'm going to tell you today. Be comfortable. If you want to lie down and listen, fine. It's adult kindergarten story time. <laughs> um, I call it The Legend of Ashtanga Yoga because we're not sure it's history because there's so many different ideas of what the truth is. One of the most debated topics is the Yoga Karanta. So I'll start right there. On Guruji's last trip with Amma, his wife, to uh, Maui, one afternoon, hanging out at Ricky Hyman's house, David Swenson put the question to Guruji. Guruji, have you ever seen the Yoga Karanta? Guruji replies, yes. And Amma quickly says, tell the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and he, wells, he goes, well, no, but. <laughs> I saw my guru Krishna Macharya's copy, and I made my copy from his copy. So that got us a little closer. As I mentioned last night, when my when I first started with Guruji, my first class with him, we sat down and he said, I'm going to teach you a series of, of asanas more than 5,000 years old. It can be chanted move by move, breath by breath in Sanskrit. It comes from the book, the Yoga Karanta, written by the yogi Vamana, V-A-M-A-N-A, in the 11th century. I believed him. <laughs> I mean, and it was so crazy, why would he make up such a story, you know? I believed anything he told me, and I really never caught him in a lie in all these years, so I think he might have told me the truth. Anyway, I always read my whole life. I, I just wanted to know about everything, like all of y'all do, and um, I wanted to know the history of yoga. I knew it was more than 5,000 years old, was literally caveman exercises, because yoga was created before writing was even created. So it's prehistoric. It was passed down through the centuries and was, you know, it, it was always only known by a few people. It was a, it was a non-secret secret. It was there if you really wanted to know it, but a lot of people have lived and died and never cared a thing about yoga. This story today begins in 1897, more than 100 years ago, in the town of Mysore, South India. A boy was born named T. Krishnamacharya. He was the son of a priest and a lineage of priests. His father was a priest, his grandfather was a priest, and all the way back. According to the story, by the age of five, he was getting up with his father at 3.45 a.m. From 3.45 a.m. to dawn in India is called Brahma Mahurti, God's time, because the earth is the quietest and also it's the coolest. So he would get up with his father and he would chant. That's when we practiced yoga in Mysore, just because it was so hot that if you weren't finished by 6 a.m., it was just too hot. Anyway, so the yoga shala door opened at 4. Anyway, Krishnamacharya was a bright child. He excelled in class um, all the way through school. He was particularly noted that he was a great debater because in the old times, you know, debating was really a, a great skill. He finished school in Mysore and went <laughs> off to university in somewhere outside of Mysore. I'm not sure where. He got, I knew, but I forgot. <laughs> And you can look it up. This stuff is on Wikipedia probably, and there's different biographies of Krishnamacharya. Anyway, after college, he went for postgraduate studies at Benares Hindu University in Benares, the most ancient city on earth, they say. Uh, BHU is like the Sorbonne or Oxford or Harvard of India. It's the ultimate uh, university. 
There he majored in Sanskrit and all the knowledge he would need to become a priest. Also, at some point, and this isn't clear, he had begun yoga practice. We don't know who his teacher was, but we know who his next teacher was. He had a schoolmate whose father was a doctor. The family was wealthy enough that they had a summer vacation home in the mountains of North India. As you know, India gets really hot in the summer, and the monsoon comes everywhere south of the Himalayas. Anybody who at all has it together gets out of town and goes high up in the mountains because it's cooler and they don't get the monsoon so bad. Krishmacharya's friend invited him to join the family and come to the mountains with them for the summer. Great invitation he accepted. Their home was in Shimla in the Himalayas. This is what they call a hill station, what we call a mountain resort. In Shimla was also the residence of the British Viceroy, Lord Irwin. At this time, the British ruled India, and the most powerful man in India was the Viceroy, Lord Irwin, and his residence was up in Shimla. Lord Irwin had some sort of respiratory problem. None of the English doctors could help him. So someone suggested, why don't you try one of the local doctors? They know the climate and all that. Maybe they can help you. So Krishmacharya's friend's father uh, was asked, would he see Lord Irwin? They had a doctor's appointment. The doctor, when he heard that his problem was with breathing, he said, well, maybe what would help you would be doing some breathing exercises. Um, if you're interested, my friend's son is uh, pretty advanced in yoga. Maybe he could teach you some exercises that would help your breathing. Lord Irwin was open-minded enough to say, okay, I'll try it. And young Krishnamacharya was sent to the Viceroy's resident to give him a private yoga class. They hit it off, Lord Irwin liked the class, and for the rest of the summer, every day, Krishnamacharya taught Lord Irwin privates in yoga. Lo and behold, at the end of the summer, Lord Irwin was all better. He and he was really happy, you know, he, he didn't have this respiratory problem anymore. He wanted to reward his young teacher. And again, he's the most powerful man in Asia, probably, or at least in India. He uh, could fulfill any wish. From getting to know young Krishnamacharya, he had found out that Krishnamacharya's, you know, his greatest dream was to continue his yoga st studies. At this time, the legend went that the greatest living yogi was a na man named Rama Mohan Brahmachari. He was a Nepalese man, over a hundred years old. I guess he couldn't get enough privacy in Nepal, so he had gone to Tibet. He lived in a cave on, the, uh, on Mount Kailash. At the bottom of Mount Kailash is Lake Manishrovar. Mount Kailash is the most, the number one pilgrimage spot for any Hindu. Most Hindus never make it to Mount Kailash because the only way to get there back then was walking. It took weeks to get there. You had to cut across mountain passes that were snowed in all year long and it was quite an expedition. Also, the border was closed between India and China and you had to have all sort of special permits to enter China. Well, Lord Irwin, as a surprise to Krishnamacharya, said, I'm going to fulfill your wish. Um, I am going to make it possible for you to go look for this yogi, see if he really exists, and if so, ask him if he'll teach you yoga. They, this is the end of the summer. They can't leave until next spring, you know, after the snow melts and all that. So in the coming months, the whole expedition was planned. They got the pack animals, the Sherpas, the camping equipment, the cooks, the everything they need. They had special clothes made. Even um, they had leather shoes made. Now, 
Krishnamacharya was Paka Brahman, that means pure Brahman, so he had never worn leather before. So he had to get some sort of special dispensation from a priest that it was okay for him to wear leather. All this happened. Springtime comes along, the weather starts warming up, the snow's melting, and off they went. They left uh, Benares or wherever, um, left India, heading north to cross the Himalayas. After weeks and weeks, they get into Tibet, they get to Lake Manishrovar. As you, if you've heard of this place, they say if you bathe there, all your sins are gone until you come out and then you start accumulating more. Anyway, um, they asked around and found out, yes, there is a yogi uh, living in a cave on this mountain and got directions. Krishnamacharya uh, goes to the cave and according to the story as Guruji told it, he gets there, I don't guess he had a door, but he announces himself, oh, hello, hello, and the old hundred-year-old yogi comes out. What do you want? <laughs> Can't you see I've come all the way to Tibet to get a little peace? Here you are at my door bothering me. Where do I have to go just to get a little peace? <laughs> and Krishnamacharya says, please, sir, forgive me, but I've heard you're the greatest yogi. I'm a little yogi, and I want to beg you, will you please teach me? I really respect who I think you are, and I've come to ask you, will you teach me yoga? Brahmachari says, well, first of all, all the instruction manuals of yoga are written in Sanskrit. Can you even read Sanskrit to follow the directions? Krishnamacharya goes, well, as a matter of fact, I just got my postgraduate degree in Sanskrit. And the old guy goes, we'll see. And the next day, he t tests him on his knowledge of yoga. Krishnamacharya passes the test and is accepted as a student. He lives there in the cave for the next eight years, learning all aspects of yoga, including the hatha yoga, the asanas and pranayama. And the asanas that he learned, according to the legend, was what you were doing this morning. This, uh, the instructions of how to practice yoga from the Yoga Karanta. At the end of the eight years, one day, the guru says, okay, I'm finished teaching you, pay me. Krishnamacharya goes, whatever you want, you can have. You've taught me yoga, the jewel of priceless value. And that's what they call India, in India, called yoga, the jewel of priceless value. Because what's more valuable than know how to take care of yourself and have peace of mind, even in the most stressful situations and all that? The guru says, don't mistake. I'm not asking you for money. I, could, I don't have anywhere to spend money if I had it. Your payment is the promise that you will go back to your native place, your hometown. And in your lifetime, you will teach at least one boy who knows Sanskrit all the yoga that I've taught you. And then, he, and then this knowledge will not go extinct. The knowledge of yoga is dying from the golden age. It's going to go extinct unless somebody keeps it alive. It's like he passed him the torch. Krishnamacharya goes, okay, your wish is my command. And the guru goes, and another thing, you're going to have to do this in a way that it appears acceptable to all people. You can't just be a sadhu, renunciate yogi. You have to go back, get married, have a family, live a normal life in normal society, but by your example and your teachings, keep this knowledge of yoga alive and train the kid to carry it on. Krishnamacharya agrees. He leaves the cave. He never returned to Tibet in his life. We don't know if Ramamahan Brahmachari isn't still alive living up there. <laughs> I'd like to think he is. Anyway, I'm a dreamer, why not? Um, Krishnamacharya crosses the mountains, takes months, hikes back down, 
through the Himalayas and finally gets back to Benares, where he had started eight years before. He looks around, uh, finds that some of his old school friends are still in town. They are all excited to see him. They can't wait to hear all his stories about living in a cave in a guru, with a guru in Tibet. And um, pretty soon he's the talk of the town among the sort of intellectual group uh, that like knew Sanskrit and all that. As it turned out, some of these people or their family members were connected to the king, uh, the Maharaja of Benares. And uh, word got to the Maharaja of Benares that this young man had come back after eight years learning yoga in the Tibet. By coincidence, the Maharaja of Mysore, Krishnamacharya's hometown and state, was visiting the king of Benares. In India, if you're not able to die in Benares, the best thing, next best thing is to have, be cremated and have your ashes brought to Benares and sprinkled in the Ganges River. Either the mother or sister of the Maharaja of Mysore had recently died and he had brought her ashes to Benares to sprinkle in the Ganges River. And he was staying with his buddy, the uh, Maharaja of Benares. Now, the Maharaja of Mysore was known, among other things, to be interested in yoga. And if you know of the author Paul Brunton, who wrote some great books about uh, Asia, he wrote his first was a seek, search in secret Egypt, the next one a search in secret India, and then about ten more books, including Quest for the Over Self, some amazing yoga books from like the 30s and 40s, 50s, whenever back then. Anyway, uh, the two Maharajas sent a messenger to Krishnamacharya and go, hey, uh, please come to the palace. The kings want to see you and talk to you and hear about your experience. Now, if you've ever been to Benares, on one side of the river is, the, like I said, the most ancient continuous civilization on earth. If you're on that side of the river, and that's where they have the burning ghats and all that, if you look across the river to the other side, all you see is a big palace and forest. Nobody else is allowed to live on that side of the river, and if you cross the river, they check you out. It's like how the king did his security. Okay. So they set up an appointment. Krishnamacharya crossed the river. They take him in the palace, introduce him, to the two kings. They're asking him all about his experience and he tells them about being with the hundred-year-old yogi. Afterwards, the Maharaja of Mysore says, well, I'm really interested in yoga. I'm interested in fitness. I'm interested in spirituality. As far as fitness goes, I have my own personal trainer, the modern term, this uh, English guy who comes to the palace and has been helping me stay fit. Um, due to his directions, I've built a whole English gymnasium in, on the palace grounds, so we have all the stuff. I would like to ask you to be my new personal trainer and teach me uh, yoga, which is indigenous to India. Story is, according to Guruji, that he struck the, well, he, that he was sort of played hard to get, struck a hard bar bargain. First he said, even a palace is a golden cage. After living all these years in the forest, how can I return to a city and all this? But he also remembers in the back of his mind, he's made a promise that he's got to go back to where he's from and find this child to carry on the knowledge. So he decides that he'll strike the best bargain he can. He tells the Maharaja that he wants his own living area in the quietest part of the palace so nobody will bother him. And he wants a yoga shala built equal to the gymnasium that he built for this English guy. No problem. Maharaja goes, whatever you want. That's not, I'm the Maharaja. <laughs> I can do what I want. So, Krish, 
oh my gosh, I left out a little part of this. Okay. Sorry. Sidebar. When Rama Mahan Brahmachari is saying goodbye to Krishna Macharya and sending him out, he says, by the way, if you would like to see in writing everything I've been, the, the Hatha Yoga I've been teaching you, I know of one copy of the Yoga Karanta, for sure. It's in the library of the Maharaja of Calcutta. Go to Calcutta if you're able to, ask to see it, it's not like a lending library. They're not going to let you take it home. But you can look at it and see what it is. Now, I don't know whether Krishnamacharya did this immediately or subsequently. But at some point, Krishnamacharya went to Calcutta, went to the library, found this yoga karanta that now they say has been eaten by the ants because it was written on palm leaves or papyrus or something like that. Anyway, and he copied the yoga karanta. And that's the one Guruji said, saw, said that he saw and made his own copy of. Okay, now back to the main story. So, Krishnamacharya goes back to Mysore. His family does an arranged marriage and uh, he's married and starts living in an apartment of the palace. If you've been to Mysore, you might know that on the grounds of the main palace, because there's a few around town, the one in the center near the market, and then there's another one up on top of Chamundi Hill. There's Lalita Mahal Palace at the base of Chamundi Hill, which is now a five-star hotel. Anyway, the main palace where he mainly lived, um, on the grounds is the Maharaja Sanskrit College. Now, as you know in India, um, the they have not separated church and state. If you're American, you know what I'm talking about because America was found, founded to separate church and state because in Europe, the church and the kings ruled everybody. The first time I was in Ireland, I look up and see this huge palace and I go, what king lay there? there? And they go, that wasn't the king, that's the bishop. You know how it was in Europe. This is why America was formed, you know, for religious freedom and all that. Anyway, um, in India, they have the caste system. The highest caste is the Brahmin caste, the priest. They are even higher than the king. The king is a member of the second caste, the Kshatriya, the warrior caste. But the, the kings create a society that supports the Brahmins. They don't have to do a lick of work. They just chant and pray and burn incense and wave feathers and, you know, bless everything. And they got a great life, just like the priests in Europe did. Okay, anyway, um, Krishnamacharya, uh, on the grounds uh, at the Sanskrit college is where all the boys who are studying to be the up-and-coming priests would go do their ABCs. Krishnamacharya starts teaching the king and his family, and also he uh, joins in with the faculty of the Maharaja Sanskrit College. Now, in the past, it had all been academic. They changed the curriculum so that now, each morning, before the boys started uh, memorizing the scriptures, because as you know, um, the ancient religions like Hinduism and Muslim religion, they, it's all chanted and priests memorize the scriptures. That's their education, right? At the Sanskrit college, the way it's taught is the, the leader of the class says the line once and the students repeat it twice. And they go through like that over and over, year after year, till if you make it long enough, after 26 years, you can become a bidwan, which means master, like beyond our, the super PhD, and then you get to lead the chant. Anyway, and Patabi Joyce was a Bidwan. If you've been to his house, it's Yogas and Bisharad Bidwan, master of all yoga postures. Okay, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Anyway, so Krishnamacharya now had all these young boys. He's teaching asanas and pranayama too and the basic hatha yoga, uh, trying to find the kid that's going to carry the torch after he passes on. 
each year certain students would graduate and they would go back to the hometown where they were where they were from and start being the priests in that town. To support them, occasionally Krishnamacharya would make a little tour of South India to the hometowns of his different students and uh, he would go to the temple where they were. Now, another thing, you know, I was talking about the four castes in India. In the temples, there's four sanctums. In the lowest caste can only get in the first door, second class, second door. Only the Brahmins could get in all the way to the center. A lot of you have re uh, been curious about yoga, studied up. Perhaps you've read Hatha Yoga, Pradapika, Jiranda Samhita, Shiva Samhita, the different scriptures on Hatha Yoga. And if you've noticed, each one of them has three parts. It'll describe the yoga posture. The second part will tell the benefits of it and the whole next 30% of it is all the curses that are going to fall upon you if you teach an unworthy student. It is full of them, chapter after chapter. Okay, so this I imagine uh, when he did these speeches and demonstrations, it was far enough in the temple that nobody but the Brahmin saw this because this sacred knowledge wasn't just for everybody. They had been threatened by their scriptures not to teach just anybody. Okay, so um, Krishnamachari would take, you know, maybe half a dozen of his best students and he'd go to a town and to support his graduate student, he'd uh, give a speech on the benefits of yoga and like that and then have some of the boys do a yoga demonstration of the asanas. When Patabi Joyce was about 14 years old. His hometown was a little village called Nunjangud. It's about 30 miles or 30 kilometers from Mysore. I went there with Guruji, went to his family home in 1973, and even at this time there was not a paved road in this little village. Everybody in the whole village lived in simple sort of mud houses with thatched roofs, and the temple in the middle of it was this big, beautiful thing with gold and jewels and, and all this. This temple in South Indian villages, and you see the same in Thailand, is the center of the village and everybody bathes each morning and goes there and that's the way it was there. Okay, so one day at the, uh, the temple in Nunjangud, there, oh, but it could have been another village nearby called Halabid. But in one of these places, uh, Patabi Joyce heard that there was going to be a speech on yoga and a yoga demonstration. So he went and when he saw the yoga, it was just like me. When I saw it, I go, yes, I want to learn this. He uh, went back to his father, who was the town astrologer. Brahmin caste, the Brahmins were the astrologers. Anyway, he told his father that he wanted to follow Krishnamacharya and learn yoga. Now, all the way back when Guruji's telling me this story 40 years ago, at this point he stressed to make sure I knew that he had his family's permission and blessing. And I know why, because since then, there are numerous biographies of Patabi Joy saying that he ran away from home and arrived in Mysore with two rupees and his family didn't know where he was. I saw that, I was in Chicago and there's a, they got a Chicago yoga magazine. Last time I was there I'm looking at a copy and it's in there. Just to check up on my stories I was looking in Wikipedia about Patabi Joyce and this same erroneous story is there that he ran away. Patabi Joyce wanted me to know that he did not run away, he had his family's blessing. Anyway, sidebar, and I'll get back to this part. In 1975, I brought Guruji and Manju to Encinitas, California. It wasn't like a weekend workshop they have now or a week like this. They came and stayed for four months. <laughs> it was great. They lived in my home. They, I gave them my bedroom. I slept on a futon in the living room floor. 
It was fabulous. It was like a dream come true for me. And I had Gridgey right there. I could uh, ask him any question I want with Manju to translate. Anyway, um, one night near the end of the time, Gridgey's going, you guys got it so easy. I just show up and teach you the asanas as fast as you can learn them. It wasn't that way in my day. I had to beg for every posture I got. Just like the old story, I had to walk 10 miles to school in the snow, uphill both ways, you know, that one. Okay, he got, and um, he said, when I got to Mysore, I got an appointment to meet Krishnamacharya. He said that I had to meet him at 12 noon. Guruji showed up five minutes late. Krishna Matacharya told him, big mistake. Now, if you want to see me, you've got to sit on the front porch in full lotus till sunset. Or buzz off, kid. And Patabi Joyce did it. He was proud to say, I sat there and just melted in the sun and lotus till sunset. And Krishna Macharya invited him. And this is sort of one of the stories of the legend, you know, about how it was so hard to get accepted student. Anyway, Krishna Macharya accepted him as a student, this little boy, 14 years old, no money, no, nothing going on. And not only accepted as a student, he moved, invited him to move in to the house and live with him. And that's why Guruji said, I was more of a servant than a yoga student. I was their houseboy. He had to mop, clean, sweep, run errands. But not only did he live there, uh, Krishna Macharya got him enrolled in Sanskrit college. And Patabi Joyce started going to, to school each morning with Krishna Macharya. Okay, so as I said, the curriculum was Hatha yoga, first hour or so, you know, hour and a half, whatever. And then the classes. Patabi Joyce uh, stuck in there and he was a good, enthusiastic student. He started at the age of 14, as I mentioned. By the age of 20, he was the head of the class, the most advanced student. Um, Guruji told me that by this stage, Krishnamacharya is getting older and uh, Guruji became his teaching assistant. Meaning, a lot of mornings, it was Patabi Joyce running the class and Krishnamacharya wouldn't even show up. And occasionally, he'd drop in and check it out. Now, Krishnamacharya got all the honor because he's the big guru, but Patabi Joyce is basically his teaching assistant like we have in our universities. Okay, back up a little. After about Three years of Patabi Joyce living there when he, um, so he's 17. Um, another boy is brought to live with the family. He's the younger brother of Krishna Macharya's wife. Her younger brother, they, uh, she and her younger brother had come from a very poor family. Um, uh, he had had uh, emphysema. I don't know. He had a half dozen diseases. He was just this really wimpy, sickly little child. None of the doctors could help him. He was lucky to be alive. Finally, of course, Guruji said, uh, uh, some of the friends or neighbors of the family go, none of the doctors around here can help him. Why don't you send poor little BKS to his crazy uncle in Mysore? who claims that he can cure anything with yoga. So they packed up little BKS Iyengar and sent him to live with his uh, brother-in-law. I wasn't uncle, brother-in-law, sorry. Anyway, so BKS Iyengar comes there and starts living at the house too. Now, I sensed there was some kind of rivalry between these two, as you could expect, but none of that was ever clear. Anyway, because for years they never saw each other. They'd be like after I got into yoga from like the 70s to 2000, they would never go to the same conference or anything. And then there was the great reunion at Guruji's 90th birthday when Ian Gar came and they kissed and made up and all that. Anyway, uh, 
what happened was this. Um, Iyengar uh, starts going to Maharaja's Sanskrit college each morning for yoga class. And um, and it was mainly Patabi Joyce was teaching the class. And in the next three years, through dedicated yoga practice, Iyengar cured himself and got strong and healthy. And if you look on the internet, uh, there's this, an old video of this, uh, this first um, Krishnamacharya practicing asanas, and then the second part is Iyengar practicing. You know what I'm talking about? Remind me and I'll tell you where that video came from. It's a great story because my friend recovered it from extinction. Anyway, so um, Iyengar, even though he was a blood relative of Krishnamacharya, he went to regular high school. He didn't go to Sanskrit college. Now, at the age of uh, 58, in 1973, May of 1973, oh, I'm backing up. Okay, when Krishnamacharya turned 58, he retired. He moved down to, um, to Madras and lived in a little village south of Madras where he lived the rest of his life and that's where the uh, Vinny Yoga school is now from his son and grandson and all that business. Okay, so he was moving, he had to choose his successor. So of all the students, he chose Patabi Joyce to be the, his successor, to be the personal uh, guru for the Maharaja and also the yoga teacher at Maharaja Sanskrit College. They had a big ceremony at the palace. The Maharaja was there and the Maharaja, um, I visualize it was like King Arthur knighting Sir Lancelot. Uh, uh, the Maharaja uh, gave Patabi Joyce the title that we mentioned before. Yogasan Visharad Vidwan, master of all yoga postures, and he became the new yogi for the king. A huge honor. Not only was an honor, he was given a piece of property and a home to live in, in a neighborhood where all the people on the block were also members of the Maharaja's court. And if you went to Guruji's first house, 876-1 Lakshmi Puram, first cross, this is the home that Guruji was given by the king. His next door neighbor was the Maharaja's incense maker, which we, if you have time, remind me, I'll tell you his life story. It's amazing. And then across from that was the Maharaja's sister, the Bagan, and on and on. This is where Guruji was living when I met him. Okay, Guruji was every day went to work at the palace, went in the morning, taught the boys, then also did the Sanskrit part uh, on his own, continued learning Ayurveda, and after 26 years, Patabi Joyce became a, a, a vidwan also of the scriptures and all that business. So he, Patabi Joyce was one of the most well-educated people in India. Okay, at the end of 1973, um, Patabi Joyce, retired and decided that he would open a little yoga school at his home. The, um, the house, if you've been there before, had two buildings. The front building was the residence where they lived. You walk in, there's a living room, bedroom on the left where Saraswati and Ramesh and Sh Sh uh, Shami and uh, Sharat live. When I got to my shore, Sharat was six years old, Shami was nine, anyway, and Ramesh on the right. And then there's a little door going through the back, and then there's the yoga room. The students didn't generally open, enter through the front door. There was a side entrance that you go in from an alley. Downstairs was the yoga room, then there were some stairs from the entrance going up to a second floor. Up there was Guruji's office, a sort of what they call the changing room, and then Guruji and Amma's bedroom. Okay, Guruji starts living in this house and um, starts setting up yoga classes. As Manju mentioned yesterday, 
all the students they got were sick people that doctors sent because they couldn't figure out how to fix them and they thought maybe yoga was fixing them. So Guruji's having his classes going. Um, one of the things that Guruji was most proud of was that he could cure diabetes. This is a big statement. There is not a person in America that is making the claim, I can cure diabetes. You ask Guruji, he'll tell you, yoga will cure diabetes. And the proof was two students that I knew personally. One of them was Krishna the tailor. He uh, was a diabetic and also another man, it seems like his name was Raju, he was a police detective. Both of them were so weak from diabetes, they're on insulin, can't hardly do anything. And Guruji started them with up yoga practice and day by day had them by the most minuscule amount reduce the amount of insulin they took. Both of them within two years were strong and healthy and off of taking insulin, which is an amazing. I still don't know of any other doctor who's ever been able to do that. So anyway, this is the scene in Mysore. Uh, Ashtanga Yoga Research Institute is teaching these people. And also, each day when I started class, a few little kids would come. And so that their parents knew they weren't playing hooky, Gridge, you had to sign their attendance book to make sure they were going. So this is the scene in Mysore in October 1973. Like I said, Guruji retired in May 73 and uh, starts doing this. Because I really am trying to get this right in my own mind, there's a, an editorial note. <laughs> Nunjan Good was not Guruji's hometown, it was Amaz's hometown. Guruji's hometown was Kaushika. So when I went to Nunjan Good, it wasn't Guruji's hometown. So that sort of changes where Guruji saw the demonstration. And that's why it may have been in Halabita Belur, which is closer to Kaushika. But anyway, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> okay, change of scene. Summer of 1969, later named the Summer of Love. This was the year of Woodstock and four other major rock festivals. Woodstock was the most famous, but Atlanta was the biggest. More than 700,000 hippies arrived from every direction. And I went. <laughs> <laughs> With my girlfriend Leslie and my housemate Steve. We got there we could not get the car closer than about three miles. Cars everywhere just parked. There was a super highway going through. We parked and we had to walk like more than an hour to get there. Anyway, we finally get there. Our tickets, I think, were $30 for the whole weekend. We paid and we went in. Later, it was one of those rock festivals where they knocked down the walls and everybody came in. And that's how it was over. I think 770,000 people were there maybe bands playing all weekend, including the grand finale Sunday, Jimi Hendrix. It was Jimi Hendrix's last big show, because you know he died in 69, along with uh, Jim Morrison and, Morrison and uh, Janis Joplin. So this was Hendrix's last and one probably maybe biggest his performance he ever did, and I was there for it. We got as close to the stage as we could. The master of ceremonies comes on stage, his name is Tom Law. I look at this guy and my jaw drops. He's the most handsome fella and he has this long blonde hair with a ponytail almost to his butt. Now this is 1969. The Beatles have long hair to their collar. My hair now is like maybe covering my ears. I look at this guy, his hair is like this long. I'm going, is he from another planet? How did a boy think of not cutting his hair so long ago that it could be this long? Or either wise, otherwise he was eating fertilizer or something. <laughs> anyway, just his appearance got my attention. He comes on stage up the microphone. Now mind you, this is a rock festival. There is no police around. The smell of marijuana is everywhere. <laughs> 
People are giving away LSD. The whole place has the potential to get loaded. <laughs> Tom Law comes on early enough in the morning, gets the microphone and goes, now before you get high on drugs, I want to show you how to get naturally high with yoga. My ear perks up. Naturally high? I've heard that term. I'm a little skeptical, but I'm open-minded. So I got as close as I could to the stage. It was still early enough. The sun wasn't too hot. And he lay, led a basic introductory yoga class for thousands of people in kundalini yoga, as taught to him by Yogi Bhajan. Tom Law and his brother John Philip Law, who was a movie star back at that time, um, were two of the first students of Yogi Bhajan. Uh, and Tom had been asked to be the master of ceremonies of Woodstock and these four other festivals. If you want to look up Tom Law, look up Tom Law Woodstock, and it shows him there teaching yoga. He's on the internet. All this stuff is available now. Anyway, he teaches a basic introductory class in Kundalini Yoga. Now, if you're like me, you have done 10 or 20 kinds of yoga, just checking out all the different ways to see which is the best. Everybody wants the best. And so you may know that Kundalini Yoga is taught by Yogi Bhajan of all the different kinds of yoga is closer to Ashtanga Yoga than any other kind, even more so than Iyengar or Vinaya Yoga by Desikacharya because the first focus in Ashtanga Yoga and Yogi Bhajan's Kundalini Yoga is root lock, Mula Bandha. And second, deep breathing. Now, Kundalini Yoga, they breathe faster than we do, but they're doing this constant Mula Bandha. So I'm following along, doing the postures, breathing, and I'm getting a little dizzy, maybe <laughs> naturally high. And I'm going, whoa, yoga, all right. <laughs> you know. Well... The weekend passes, he, he teaches during, on stage each morning, then the day he has a little area he's teaching, I'm right there trying to just learn it. I am fascinated. They say when the student's ready, the teacher appears, and here he was. After this, I just want to know, back, know yoga. At the end of the weekend, we go back to Chapel Hill. Um, this is not the first time I've heard of yoga. My freshman year, no, it was my sophomore year. I had pledged Sigma Chi fraternity one afternoon. Later, after I became a hippie, I quit. <laughs> when uh, uh, we were hanging out at this guy's house, his name was Scott Cole. Never seen him since college. Anyway, Scott is talking. He goes, have you ever heard about the yogis in India? None of us know what he's talking about. He goes, well, there's these guys, they, can, they sit in a lotus, and he put his legs in a lotus, and believe it or not, I'd never seen anybody sit in a lotus before. Nobody went to a country club where I went and did that, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, he said, these guys can sit like this for six months, living off a cracker a day in a thimble full of water. And then there'll be some emergency, like a boulder blocking the train track. They'll flip their legs out of lotus, jump up, push the boulder out of the way, then sit back down for another six months. <laughs> this is the first I hear of yoga. And I go, I think he's exaggerating. <laughs> but I was interested. And then I hear, I'm start, you know, then I hear yoga, I'm looking it up a little. Information wasn't available then like it is now with the internet, but I'd hear about these yogis in India that got older and wiser. I looked around North Carolina. Nobody was getting older and wiser. They were getting sick and senile and starting to go in for operations at 40. You know, as a kid, you hear about your parents' friend going in for operations and all this stuff. I was terrified. I didn't even want to get a shot. I knew I didn't want an operation. Anyhow, I knew as a child that I had to do something to stay healthy. I looked around all my neighborhood, and I lived in one of the nicer neighborhoods in town. I knew who everybody was back then. You know who everybody is. Even the richest person in the neighborhood. I did not envy any of them. The whole thing, there had to be a better way to live. But I didn't know what it was. Anyway, I get back to Chapel Hill. 
in the spring of my senior year, 1971, yoga starts coming at me from every direction. Um, I had two college roommates, Steve and Rusty. You, I don't know how many of y'all know American history, but when the war in Vietnam started, they needed more soldiers. So they had a lottery. And um, everybody who was oh, 18, you had to register for the draft. You had to sign up your name and give them your address and say you're 18 and available for military service. Just not signing up got you two years in jail. So everybody on their 18th birthday had to go sign up. Okay, they have this lottery um, and they have, a, just like any kind of lottery, they have a barrel with all the pieces of paper on it. And each one had a day of the year, like June 13th, May 27th, whenever. They spun the thing, reached in. They, the first thing they pulled out was May 27th. Everybody who was May 27th got the number one. And they were going to be the first ones to go into the Army, i.e. to Vietnam. So actually you were gambling for your life. I sat, and we all sat in the fraternity house and watched this thing, and people would groan when their number came up because nobody wanted to go to Vietnam. Back then, there was a bumper sticker. Um, Join the army. Visit exotic places and kill strange people. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we, you know, you remember that? Yeah. Anyway, um, we were anti-war, that's for sure. Um, we'd never heard of Vietnam. <laughs> um, anyway, my number, fortunately, I think was 237, 257. Anyway, high enough that I thought I would probably be safe. But my friend Rusty's number was 50. It looked bad for Rusty. And as soon as you graduated college, they knew it. College would keep you exempt. But as soon as you graduated, bam, they got you. So... We're, it's the spring of our senior year, graduation's coming up. Rusty is not going to go in the Army. Your alternative was, one, to leave the country and go to Canada or Amsterdam, that's where a lot of people went, or go to jail for two years. So it was two years in the Army or two years in prison. Rusty doesn't want to leave the country. His family owns all this property and big business that he was going to inherit and all that. So he goes, fine, I'll go to jail. He decided <laughs> that he wanted to stay fit in jail, so he went and bought Richard Hittleman's 28-day yoga plan. Maybe some of y'all seen this, one of the first yoga books. Anyway, I come home from class, and Rusty's on the floor in his underpants or bathing suit or something, and he's <laughs> opened to page one. And, and I look, and he's doing yoga, and I go, this, you're doing yoga, right? Like the rock festival. And he goes, yeah. And I go, hang on. Let me get out of my clothes. I come in, <laughs> and we do, we do lesson number one together. And we didn't miss a day. And since that day, I have uninterrupted daily practice. For, year, for a few years, I, it was every day. Then I got to Guruji. We got holidays, Saturday, new moon, <laughs> full moon. But anyway, I started daily practice. We made it through the Richard Hittleman 28 or 30 day plan. In that time, um, a girl that uh, I was friends with, going out a little bit, came by and she said, I gotta show you something. I know you're gonna love this. You gotta read it. It's a book called Be Here Now by Baba Ramdas. Baba Ramdas, uh, y'all must not all know who Baba Ramdas is, right? Well, quickly. Baba Rondas was Dr. Richard Alpert. He was a professor at Harvard University. Oh, yeah, for your reading list, read Be Here Now, because <laughs> you're writing notes. Anyway, um, with Timothy Leary, and everybody's heard of Timothy Leary. Anyway, these guys went to Mexico uh, and met a woman, a bruja, uh, uh, a magic woman who gave them magic mushrooms. Now, they're in the psychology department and studying and writing their books about psychology. They take mushrooms down in Mexico and all the answers to all their questions are revealed. And um, 
And so they write a few scientific papers about their experiences in mushroom, take a group of students down there the next summer. It's just a, and they are tripped out, so the police throw them out of the country because really they're just having this huge party. Anyway, they're back at Harvard. Their uh, research, Harvard research papers on altered states of consciousness reach people in Switzerland at Sandoz who have accidentally discovered LSD. Now at this time, LSD is legal. LSD was legal till 1966. Nobody knew what it was, but it started getting passed around. And um, it got famous in California <laughs> and caused an uproar and they've made it illegal since then. Anyway, um, so uh, quickly before we don't get off the subject, uh, they, Leary and Alpert get fired from their positions at Harvard. They are just too much of a scandal, tripping out all the students and all this stuff, you know. So both, not together, but separately, they both went to India. And both of them have written books on their experiences in uh, India. Um, Alpert wrote Be Here Now. And it talks about going to India, looking all over, trying to learn, find yoga, meditation, a guru, until he, he meets this, this tall California guy with long blonde hair, dreadlocks, Bhagwan Das. Maybe some of y'all know who Bhagwan Das is. Uh, he used to live on Maui for a while, so I know him a bit. Anyway, Bhagwan Das took him to Neem Karali Baba, the crazy Baba, who... Um, um, Alpert gets there, and um, he doesn't, uh, Neem Krali Baba is a mosque Baba. He's naked, and occasionally if he's cold, he puts a blanket around him, but he's uh, one of these naked Babas, like the story Manju was talking about. They got him. I've seen him in India. Anyway, they're sitting there, and, um, and Maharaji, uh, the guru, says, uh, so do you have any of this medicine with you? the LSD, and because uh, then it's legal and you can carry it around. And he goes, yeah, I got a vial of it. And he goes, let me see it. So uh, Alpert goes to his, temp uh, his tent, comes back, and he's got this bottle of tabs of LSD, or tablets or tabs, whatever. And uh, Guru says, um, so how much does one take? And uh, he says, oh, maybe a half a one or a whole one, or if you really want to get out there too. And he goes, let me see it. He takes it, pours it, a whole thing out on his hand, looks at it, takes the whole thing, and then pulls the blanket over his head and goes down. Now, the Indians don't know what's going on. Richard Alpert is terrified. What is going to happen to this old man, you know? After 20 minutes, he comes up, his eyes are blazing, and he goes, am I crazy yet? And then just carries on. Mind completely tripped on acid, and nothing's changed, because he's already there. It didn't do a thing. This blew this doctor of, of psychiatry's, or philosophy, whatever, doctor of psychiatry's mind, and he goes, uh... Sir, can I sign up for your yoga class? <laughs> and he stayed for the next year. And he was assigned his Hatha yoga t teacher, Baba Hari Das, who later came to America, lived in Santa Cruz. Is he still alive? Yes. He's a long way out. Anyway, so Baba Hari Das was his yoga teacher, and he came to Santa Cruz. I've met him, practiced yoga with him. We, you know, we're all looking for all the gurus back then. Anyhow... At the end of this time, Alpert wants to uh, share what he, he wants to turn everybody on to yoga, you know, save the world, get world peace. Like Annie was saying last night, if 51% if of people did yoga, we'd have world peace. Anyway, so um, he writes this book, Be Here Now. He is involved with the um, Brotherhood of Light, a commune in Laguna Beach who become... Oh, sorry, you're right. You were there, weren't you? Brotherhood of Eternal Love. Anyway, a member of Bro Thank you, Pistachio. You should put Stachio on the stage and have him tell you some of those stories. Anyway, um, uh, a member of that group sends uh, Jeannie, my friend, a copy of the manuscript of the book before it's even published. It's still in three separate parts. I read this thing cover to cover, 
probably as fast as I could get through it. At the end of that time, I go, whoa, I am going to India. I want to find a guru like this. Anyway, and it, I, but it was sort of like an abstract idea. And I'd never met anybody who'd been to India. I didn't even know anybody who'd been to India. Anyway, this seed was planted. Then, I meet some people who are living on a commune outside of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where I was in the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And um, they invite me out to their commune one day in April. Um, I drive out there in my old Chevrolet, pull up and uh, park. And in the shade by the barn, there's this fellow. He has a blanket on the ground, so he's in the shade. And he's doing headstand with his, with his legs in lotus. And I go, whoa. All right, go over, sit down. He finally comes down a hedge town. I go, this is yoga, right? And he goes, yeah. And I go, well, I've been learning some yoga, but it's from a book. Uh, I see you're much more advanced than me. Will you teach me? Whatever you know, will you teach me? And he goes, well, I don't know that much, but a guy named George who's living in the little cottage down by the lake, he's been teaching us because his wife was... Uh, the ex-wife of Timothy Leary. And they had started yoga together in California at the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. And then had moved to North Carolina and are, you know, living out here. So anyway, he said, yeah, come back tomorrow and we'll have a yoga practice together. So I come back. His name's Rick. We're practicing yoga. And he has Swami Satchitananda's book, Integral Yoga Hatha, the one that Danny mentioned. I had not seen it before. I open it up and I look and there's these, it's a big book. It's a, uh, what you call a coffee table book. It was uh, produced by Peter Max. You know the great psychedelic artist Peter Max? Peter Max went to Sri Lanka and he met Swami Satchitananda and brought him back to America and set him up teaching yoga classes in New York City and uh, took pictures of him doing all the, postures and made this book Integral Yoga Hatha. There's this beautiful old man with the long gray hair, long beard, sparkly eyes. It's the first time I ever heard a Nali Kriya. This old guy sucked up his stomach, you know how you do the circles, and I am just blown. I go buy this yoga book and uh, it was a treasure of mine for years till it finally just wore out and fell apart. It went around the world with me. Anyway, so the one thing I remember from that yoga session was Rick saying, while you're doing your yoga, try to be a yogi. Now time out. This week we haven't yet defined yoga. Yoga, according to Patanjali in his Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, the first written book on yoga, says yoga chitta viritti narod. Yoga is cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. Yoga is peace of mind. Be here now. Okay. So, um, anyway, uh, Rick says, while you're doing your yoga, try to be a yogi, meaning keep your mind focused. You know, you learn the higher limbs of yoga, concentration, meditation, samadhi. Your yoga practice should be a moving meditation. Then when you're finished, lie down in corpse. Let your mind to enjoy an even deeper state of meditation. Then when your heartbeat, temperature, everything's back to normal, your session is finished. Stand up, walk out. Try to maintain this state of yoga. You'll last about 15 minutes, then, become the, then go back to being the same old jerk you always were. <laughs> but as soon as you catch it, go back to the state of yoga over and over till more and more you're in a state of yoga all the time. Okay, this was his teachings to me. Good advice. Okay. Um, now we come up to May, the first weekend of May, 1971. At our school, this is May Day, Cinco de Mayo, big party uh, weekend. For our school, it's right, right near the end of the year, before exams. It was, our school had, had uh, all these big bands hired. I remember it was Joe Cocker, Pacific Gas and Electric, Spirit, um, uh, uh, Grand Funk Railway, all the big bands were playing. Um, in the summer, I was a lifeguard at the beach. I was the youngest lifeguard, and um, 
and my, the one I mentioned last night, my guru, Booty, he was the oldest lifeguard. He was the one who told me, you never have to work. Your only limitation is your imagination. You can go anywhere, do anything. And I believed him, and I wanted to do it. But I knew I had to be healthy. The most exotic places are also the places you're most likely to get sick. So just naturally from childhood, and this was reinforced, if I'm going to really be free, travel the world, camp out, whatever, I need to be really strong. I saw this yoga as the path to perfect health. That's what it advertised in all the yoga books. Okay, so as I mentioned, I've been practicing yoga daily now. I've invited up my friends from the beach. Our house is full. They're camping in the backyard. The music doesn't start till Friday night, but the party's been going since Tuesday. Um, uh, I've broken up with my girlfriend, uh, Leslie, who I mentioned I went to Atlanta Rock Festival. I'm sort of getting over that, you know. But um, uh, I've invited up this girl, Laura, who had, was really beautiful, and we had gone to Mardi Gras together, and I wanted to date for the weekend, so Laura had come up. There's a knock at the door. I open the door, and it's two guys and a girl. I look at the girl, love at first sight. She looked at me, our eyes locked. Apparently, it was mutual. <laughs> oh, my God, she was the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. I got a problem, Laura. <laughs> so I go in, and I go, and, but then, now again, this is 1971, free love. <laughs> so I go, uh, listen, Laura, um, I really want to be with this girl, Debbie. Uh, and she goes, that's great. I want to be with your friend, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> then in Hawaii, we go, shaka. Anyway, and so that's what happened. And actually, they were together till she started med school in the fall and went to the Midwest. Anyway, so I'm with Debbie. We go to the music. Oh, it's just fabulous. And I'm um, talking to her. Oh, okay, so here's her story. She and these two guys are driving to Washington, D.C. Uh, this is May Day weekend, 1971, the day that all the hippies in America joined to stop the war in Vietnam. If you know American history, they circled the Pentagon. Allen Ginsberg led everyone oming to levitate the Pentagon. The, remember the pictures of the, the hippies putting flowers in the rifles of the National Guard? This was that situation. Okay, so they're driving from Miami up the East Coast, right? If you don't know uh, American geography, the South on the East, you got Miami at the South, Carolina's in the middle, Washington further up. You go through North Carolina, through Virginia, the top of Virginia is Washington, D.C. Okay, so maybe five, six hours away. Anyway, so they're on the way to stop the war in Vietnam, and somebody's given our address, and they go, can we crash here? Sure, if you can find room, join the party. And so they did it. Next morning, we get up after staying up half the night, all the night. Anyway, and Debbie, I go, so listen, want to stick around and go to the music? And she goes, nope, we're still going to stop the war in Vietnam. But Jeffrey, the driver, has this Mustang with four seats, and there are only three of us. Want to go with us to Washington, D.C.? I think about two seconds. Wherever you are going, I will go. <laughs> Jump in the car and off we go. We drive all day, get there in the afternoon. Uh, Jeffrey's sister is at American University, right in Washington, D.C. She stays with another friend, gives us her dorm room. We spend the night. Next morning, we get up early, go to join the protest. It's in front of the Lincoln Memorial. We show up. I think I've died and gone to heaven. As far as you can see, it's hippies wearing tie-dyed clothes, uh, it's a little before airbrush, but you know, the smell of patchouli is everywhere, remember patchouli? Anyway, and on stage, the band The Fugs is playing, and uh, I just go, yes, there is hope. If all the youth of America comes together, the uh, adults can't overlook this. If everybody goes, we don't want war, and it looks like every student in America is there, you know, 
I am just on cloud nine thinking, wow, you know, just like Gandhi said, passive, non-resistant, non-violence resistant can conquer and all that. I just am in cloud nine. We're listening to the music. And then suddenly, it's like a dark cloud came over. The energy changed. It got quiet, and I looked around, and we were completely surrounded by 10,000 Darth Vaders. All these soldiers in paramilitary black clothes with the helmets, the shields, the batons, and they start moving in, beating everybody. It was terrifying. We ran for our life, at, you know, so we didn't get beat. Now, I grew up in America. I was in Greensboro, North Carolina, the first sit-in at um, uh, uh, Woolworth's, uh, Woolworth's uh, Diner for integration. It all started there. I had seen civil dis disobedience, but this was um, black people, you know, who they were trying to keep down. I never guessed they would go for the children you know, this is the children of America, and now they're beating them. I am already upset about the civil rights thing. I know this thing isn't right, and we're doing everything we can to bring an end to that. But now we're thrown into the battle even more. We run for our lives, get in the car, and escape. Get out without us getting beat by the police. And we go, well, this is over. Might as well go home. We're driving south down the highway, and I am in the deepest depression of my life. I go, I hate America, I don't want, and I'm about to graduate college, I don't want to pay taxes to the military industrial complex. At this time, 70% of the budget is going to armaments, and the armaments factories, the military industrial complex. You know this whole thing? This is America, it's a war machine. And I go, even if I'm a, my idea, I was going to be a lawyer like ACLU, help the poor and the downtrodden. I go, I'll just get grinded by the machine. If this can't stop war, nothing can. I have had it. And so I am just in the darkest depression. I, my whole life is like ended because I don't want to be in part of the only society I know. Okay. We're approaching the North Carolina border. Debbie asked me, she goes, so listen, um, shall we drop you at your house or do you want to go with us on to Miami to Coconut Grove, which is a neighborhood in Miami, cool neighborhood. And I think about two seconds, okay. <laughs> I got my exams coming up, but at big universities back then, there was, they didn't take attendance. You, you go to class, don't go, you just take your exams and whatever you get, that's your grade. So I go, okay, I don't really need to go to class for the next two and a half weeks. Your senior year, as y'all know, you've, you've finished most of your required classes. You're taking electives anyhow. You know, you've got all your stuff to graduate. And it's all easy stuff you take your last semester. Everybody knows that, right? So this is my calendar. Um, so I go, I don't really need to go back. Wherever you are going, I will go. So we just zoom on through North Carolina, into South Carolina, Georgia, and into Florida. Drive all night. Morning comes. We're pulling into Miami. Uh, go to Coconut Grove. And um, in Coconut, Coconut Grove was a cool place at this time. On Sundays in the park, there was, there was free yoga class by this guy, Yogi uh, Swami Notes. Yogi Rama, not the Swami Rama from Hamayan Institutes. He was, to me, looked old because he had long white hair, long beard. He wore white clothes and white sarong. He had free yoga class on Sunday in the park. He'd sit on the picnic table and, you know, direct the class and tell us which asanas to do, and everybody does the asanas. Suddenly, from being in a yoga desert in North Carolina, I'm out in the park, 200 people doing yoga together. Then afterwards, there's a free Hare Krishna vegetarian feast. Man, I, this is just great, you know. Then, uh, so I do the class, and um, then he says that he has free house, classes at his house on Tuesday and Thursday night. We go to these. There's... Um, a spiritual bookstore there that just sells like yoga books and metaphysical books. I'd never seen one then. I'd go there every day and look at the books, buy a few. Coconut Grove is happening, you know. Finally, 
it's time to go back to North Carolina to take my exams. I'm not going to blow it after all this time and not graduate. Um, Debbie has a little MG sports car that she's gotten for her high school graduation. Because she's just finishing her freshman year. She's got three more years of college left. I'm graduating. I'm a senior. I'm about to get my Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and expected by my parents and I thought me to start law school in September. This was the next step, you know. Anyway, but I'm rethinking all this. Anyway, uh, Debbie and I are about to separate and we go, listen, we got to get back together. And we, we go, let's go hitchhike around Europe together this summer. That's the perfect thing for young lovers to do. And at the time, you could get a charter flight for $100 from the United States to Europe, you know, one-way ticket, usually Icelandic air. Okay, so we decide that when she finishes her exams, she's from New York in school in Miami, that she will drive through Chapel Hill, pick me up, um, we will go to New York, she knows that her parents are always gone for a few hours every afternoon and that we'll go to her house, leave her, uh, her uh, car and the keys with a note. Dear parents, see you in sept... Oh, no, here's the thing. She picks me up and goes, we got a problem. I told my parents that I was going with you to hitch a hike around Europe and they said, no dice, you're not going with this guy we don't even know to Europe. Forget it. And she goes, they're not stopping me. We'll just go when they're not home. I'll get my passport and we'll leave the car keys. Little note, don't worry, I'll come back to reassure them. So that's our plan. We pull up at her house in Rochester, New York. Sure enough, nobody's home. She knows where the key's hidden under the mat or whatever. She goes in, she comes out and goes, they're not stupid, my passport's gone. Well. We're not to be deterred. This is pre-terrorism. So um, uh, it, we go to the passport office near Niagara Falls, uh, New York, go in and say that she's lost her passport. We need a new one because we're leaving soon. And they go, no problem. For $18 more, we'll have you a new one in three days. It doesn't happen that way anymore. Anyway, <laughs> so Niagara Falls, you know, is on the border of Canada. I have a friend who's actually my old girlfriend's Leslie's brother, who's a draft dodger living in Toronto. So we go cross the border and stay with Billy for three days in his apartment near Spadina and Bloor, for those of you who know Toronto, right near Rochdale where uh, John and Yoko were. And um, anyway, I just am blown by how cool Toronto is. So um, on the bulletin board, we see a sign uh, one-way tickets, uh, Toronto to Barcelona for $100. So, uh, so we buy one for three days, for after the, we get our passport, like five days later, whatever. So we cross the border again, and this time you don't even need a passport to cross the border. All you need is your driver's license. Okay, we go pick up her passport. We're ready to go. Go drop off her house hitchhike back across the border to Toronto, uh, spend a night, get on the plane, and take off for Barcelona. We don't know what we're doing, but I have an address of a girl who's living on the island of Ibiza off of Barcelona, you know, the Balearic Islands. So uh, at this time, all the, there's no airport on, on Ibiza. You have to take the ferry. We, we land in the morning go down to the harbor, buy tickets for the ferry that night, uh, walk around Barcelona, see it a little. I'm going, wow, I'm in Europe. And uh, take the ferry all night. Next morning, get to Ibiza. I have her address. It's at this little beach village, you know, 30 miles outside of town. We hitchhike, get up there, manage to find her. She has a boyfriend from Switzerland. They've rented a little house. And they say, uh, go across the street, there's this little pension for a dollar a night. Get a room there and join the party. We go over, there's no room available. So um, they say, okay, just make a reservation, crash with us. So we come back and they go, okay, uh, let's go to the beach. We go down to the beach and start meeting all their friends. They 
are the coolest people from all over the world. And I learned the term travelers. Danny used that term last night. There's a difference between tourists and travelers. Tourists have round trip tickets and reservations and go home at the end of a week. Travelers are out to see the world as long as it's fun, you know, they just follow a whim. I'm talking to these people and I'm sort of thinking, God, I already know I don't want to go back to America if I don't have to. I'm not in a rush. And so I'm saying, so where do you go in the winter? Because Spain is the same latitude as New York. There's no really warm place in Europe in the summer if you're camping out and like that. And they go, oh, we go overland uh, through Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, go to Kathmandu, go to Goa. And the whole trip, you can hitchhike to Istanbul, and then it's only a total of $14 in bus tickets all the way across into India. So I go, this is within my budget. So suddenly, <laughs> India comes, it becomes possible. And so I'm asking people, I know that yoga's from India and all that. So we're doing our yoga each morning on the floor of wherever we're staying. After two weeks of just meeting these amazing people and talking to them about all their adventures, they've been to Machu Picchu and, you know, everywhere. And just my world has expanded. And so in college, I read uh, The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway, which is about the running of the bulls in Pomploma. And it was about to to be that time. Everybody knows what the running of the bulls is, right? Okay, so we take the ferry back to Valencia, hitchhike up to Pomploma. Boy, am I in sort of surprise. I didn't know that a million other people were also coming this thing. There was no hotel rooms available, that's for sure. We were told there's a campground outside of town. We hitchhike out there. It's so overcrowded, they're not even taking money. We just walk in. and. Uh, find these people with a campfire, join them. Uh, and uh, one guy has a van, he's an American guy, and he's saying he's gonna go to the running of the bulls in the morning. Um, and we can have a ride in with him. If you don't know what this is, in the old days, if you wanted to be a matador, the way you got your break was the running of the bulls. They block off the streets for a, like a half mile um, from like this big corral, they have the streets blocked. So it's a, a one way all the way into the bull ring. At 8 a.m., these guys, and it's just about all guys, women have better sense, they stay up all night drinking to identify themselves. They wear white clothes with a red sash, a red sash and a red bandana. They get in the street and they let the bulls go and they run in front of them. Now, if you're a serious person, a matador, you run in front of them, then you get in the ring and show your stuff, and the best one gets a gig, a bullfight. So they got the serious ones doing it, and then you've got all the drunk macho males doing this. Now, women's lib is starting strong in America. I've heard this word macho, but I don't really know what it means. I took French in school. I get to the running in the bulls, seeing these guys getting trampled and all, and I go, whoa, this is macho. Now I see what girls are complaining about. I am just disgusted. I've left America because I don't want to be an American. Now I'm looking around. I'm not sure I even want to be a male. <laughs> <laughs> I just want yoga. So I go, I don't need to see this twice. Um, and so the guy in the van, he was through, he'd seen enough too. He's driving down to the coast of Malaga and gives us a ride. We get a ride down there, get there at about noon. Get out of the car, bye bye, thanks for the ride. And it is a traffic jam and the sun is boiling. And I had never had an easier time hitchhiking in my life. Debbie was beautiful. She had this wild curly hair. I had long hair. You know, we were just got picked up like that every time hitchhiking. Nobody's picking us up. And it's sort of this traffic jam, we're roasting. Now this is before air conditioning, so everybody has their windows open. I see this camping van vehicle with two guys in it. One's got long hair, one's got really long hair. I go over <laughs> and I go, uh, excuse me, you speak English? Yes, they answer with a California accent. I go, please 
Will you get us, let us in and just get us to the edge of town? You don't have to take us forever. Just get us out of here. And they go, fine, hop in the back. So we hop in. We start riding, get to the country. We're riding along, and they don't stop and tell us to get out. And our idea is we're going to hitchhike along the Mediterranean toward Italy and sort of in the direction of India, right? Heading east. <laughs> I have... I, it's just like the last resort. There's no, I'm not going to America. I just want yoga. I've heard I can get there for 14 bucks. Okay. So we're on the road to India. So we drive all afternoon. It's starting to get sunset. They go, listen, we're going to camp out tonight. So we're going to go in the next village, go to the market, buy s- some food. Do you want to pitch in, share the price of the food, and we'll eat together, and then tomorrow morning continue? We're driving to Rome. And I go, whoa, what a ride, you know, to get to ride the next day. And Well, they didn't quite disclose Rome yet. They're feeling us out, too. They go, we'll continue tomorrow morning. Great, we got a two-day ride. So the next morning, Debbie and I get up at sunrise. We're camped by the Mediterranean. We go swim, come back, and... We, but this time you do yoga on little straw beach mats, right? So we're doing our yoga. One of the guys comes over. His name's David Herndon. Um, he puts down a mat and starts doing yoga with us. And lo and behold, this guy knows what he's doing. As a matter of fact, he's an expert. He is a yoga teacher from Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco. He's learned from the few uh, yoga teachers in America at this time, this old woman named Bobby from uh, Houston who's still alive. I still hope to meet her, but I hadn't yet. Anyway, we practice for a couple hours, then pack up, drive leisurely along. And, and now, David's got long hair, but Johnny, his boyfriend, who's Mexican, he is like Tom Law. He's got a ponytail down to here. We go into the markets, and at this time in Spain, they've never seen a males with long hair. They think Johnny's Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> We, we don't buy, they give him food everywhere we go. We send Johnny in front and we're like the three disciples. We didn't, we didn't buy food the whole trip. We're just following Jesus. Anyhow, and I just, I just am so happy. And I've got a yoga teacher. Every day we're doing yoga. Johnny's teaching us Nolly. I mean, David's teaching us Nolly and all this stuff. We just are so happy. We finally get to Italy and um, uh, it's, they got to get back to San Francisco. So we say goodbye and um, parting is such sweet sorrow. Anyway, um, we keep heading east. Um, we, we decide we're going to go to Athens and get our, um, our visas because we need visas for Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, just about everywhere. We didn't need one for Turkey, but you needed one for the rest of the countries. But a visa is no problem, like I said. All you need is give me your passport, stamp, technicality. Okay, so we hitchhike down to Ortranto, Italy, and take the ferry over to, uh, to uh, Greece. Um, the ferry stopped on the way on the island of Corfu. These are all night ferries, I guess because it's cooler down in the hole where everybody is. Anyway, we're on the all night ferry. We're sitting around downstairs with all these people talking and there's a French girl and she is really interesting. She has just spent the uh, winter living in Morocco and she has all these great stories that she's hitchhiking out in the desert. An airplane came down and picked her up and took her for a ride. One place she was so scared she went to the police station and slept in there in the jail for a night. She had these great stories. Then when she's alone and so this has given Debbie confidence too, this girl. Anyway, we get to Corfu and she says, listen, I have directions to this great beach where you can camp out and there's a freshwater spring there so you don't have to leave for drinking water and bathing. Okay, so we decide to go out there and camp with her. And about six of us from the boat get on the bus, go out to this town, walk down the hill, find this beautiful beach. Somebody has just moved out of this little lean-to, sort of made out of, bamboo and we move in so we have a little bit of shelter now I'm on the way to India and I can sit in Lotus for about three minutes and then my legs can't take it anymore so I go if I show up in India and I can't even sit in Lotus these gurus are not gonna give me the time of day 
I got to get my act together. So I decided that for 10 days, every waking moment, I would be in a yogasan. And at night, I would sleep in corpse. So that's what I'd do. I'd wake up in the morning, and, and I'd sit in lotus on one side. When I couldn't take it anymore, I'd switch to the other side. I could do that about three times, and then I'd start doing every posture I knew. Now, from reading what I'd read at this time, mastering yoga meant holding a posture for three hours. So I'm trying to hold each posture as long as possible. So I go through every posture I know. It takes two and a half, three hours. Then I lay down in corpse, get up, jump in the Mediterranean, come back, bathe in the freshwater stream, spring, go back, sit in lotus again. I do this day after day. Um, some of the other people like to go to town and buy food. I give them money, they go. I am going to be this endless yogi. Okay, at the end of 10 days, I go, okay, I'm ready for India. Let's go. <laughs> um, we, uh, we get going, but I get to Istanbul, and I get turned, I, we chicken out. Um, I realize we have hardly any money, and we're just sort of a little terrified. We um, decide, okay, this thing overland is just too dangerous. We've heard all these stories that um, let's go back to England where they speak English so we can get a job, work, and then fly to India. Okay, so we decide, okay, we're going to turn around. We get a ride hitchhiking with this guy from Chile, and he takes us to Venice, and we have a ride through back to London with him, and we're pitching in on the gas with him. And we stay up all that night. We go to San Marcos Square, and you know the orchestras are playing, and people are dancing, and it is so square. And I'm going, forget it. I'd rather die than come back to this square society. Let's go for it and go to India. It's, death is better than the box, you know. So next morning we get up, we see our friend from uh, Chile and go, listen, we've decided we're not going to go to London with you. We're going to India. We just aren't scared anymore. We just got to go for it. And he goes, well, quit here. Call this number. I met this guy last night that's driving, a guy from Scotland who's driving a bus overland to India and needs passengers for the gas. Call this number. I call up. It's the number of the youth hostel in, in, in Judica in uh, um, Venice. The guy answer. I think his name's Ian. And he goes, yep, I'm leaving in 10 minutes. For $24, I'll take you to New Delhi or $30 to Kathmandu. And meet me in Piazza Roma. That's the parking lot because you can't have cars in Venice. We go there and we're on the magic bus heading for India. Um, we get, I mean, we only have like about, he has picked up a few people, but less than a dozen. We get to Istanbul, and um, uh, at this time, the meeting place for all the travelers and hippies is Lael Pudding Shop, right across from the uh, Blue Mosque, Sultan Ahmed. There's a huge bulletin board there where everybody finds their friends because there's no internet, you know. And he puts up a sign, bus leaving for India and Kathmandu, meet here whatever day, 4 p.m. Because you don't drive in the midday, it's so hot. So we are, and we want to save money. So he tells us we can just sleep on the bus, park by this little hotel, use sort of the public bathroom. So we're really on the budget now because we're scared to run out of money. We sleep in the bus. And, um, and third day, everybody gathers, and it's 30 of the wildest looking freaks you've ever seen <laughs> heading to India. Every, there's this one guy on there, and his name's John. He wears all white clothes, he, uh, and he's going to India for spiritual purposes. He has this book of esoteric books, uh, Tibetan Yoga and Secret Doctrines, uh, Tibet's Great Yogi Milarepa, uh, the Life of Buddha, Autobiography of a Yogi, that's the first one I read. He had like 20 or 30 books. By the time I got to India, we got to India, I'd read every one. Because on the bus, I'm still trying to sit in Lotus longer and longer. So I'd sit and get into the book, you know, and try to sit in Lotus longer and longer. 
everybody else on that book is going on that bus is going to India for drugs. That's for sure. <laughs> it is just this traveling zoo of the wildest people. And I have a million stories there, but I'll, of these characters and the scenes we had, and I'm putting them down in my memoirs, but keeping it to yoga. Um, I would, as the bus is riding along, I'd get in the aisle and do yoga on the floor as we're going down the highway. Or in, they had a big back window. We uh, go through Turkey, Iran, Af oh, okay. And so in Turkey, when I was in Istanbul, we, I went to a Turkish bath and they massage you and crack your back. I'd never had my back cracked before. Then after the first night of driving all night, we go to Ankara. We pull in about 8 a.m. He goes, listen, we're just going to rest until 2 p.m. to get past the heat of the day, and then we'll drive into the night. So uh, if you want to pass the time, there's a hammam, a Turkish bath nearby. Go take a bath, because we had not had a bath in a few days, you know. And I'm not used to this, not bathing every day. Anyway, so we go to the Turkish bath. I go in there, and you get like complete massage, the whole works for a couple bucks, you know. I'm in there, it's in the morning, it's sort of, it's real steamy, the lights from a skylight in the ceiling. This guy's in there pushing and pulling and twisting and cracking me. And I look over, and I see this other customer. And he's in Donoros in bow posture, laying on his stomach, holding his ankles, right? And his masseur is standing over him, holding his feet with his feet in his back, sort of stretching him like this. And I um, turn to my masseur, who doesn't know English, so I go, and he, he's like, I want that. So he goes, lay on your back, reach up, grab your feet. He stands over me, puts his foot in my back, one, two, three, my whole back unzips, and I go unconscious. It is such a, <laughs> it's such a rush, I black out. I come around, it's hot and steamy, and uh, and all these men wearing just a towel, and I go, oh my God, I've died and gone to hell. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 then I realize, oh no, you're just in a Turkish bath. <laughs> but my back felt so good, and I go, this is great. I love this getting my back cracked, neck cracked, and all that. We get to Iran. And so the bus goes on. We get to Iran, there's no Turkish bath. I go, that's too bad. You know, I really like that. Hope I go to one of these places again. We, uh, it takes us like several weeks to get to India, but finally we get to India. Uh, everybody disperses and goes their separate direction. Um, we've been told there's this street called Jan Path Lane where they have all these little lodging guest houses for travelers. We get a room seven cents a night. Um, walking around New Delhi, and and I go, where's the yoga? You know, I'm in India. There's no sign of any yogis anywhere. It's this big metropolis, the worst air pollution I've ever been in. You know, just noise, noise and beggars and poverty and everything. So we're walking around Connaught Place, and I, I see this big bookstore, Ramakrishna and Sons. And I go in and uh, I buy a copy of Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, actually, the saint that Manju was talking about last night. Anyway, and we read it out loud to each other. It's a big book, 1,200 pages long. Anyway, um, some of the boys working in there speak English because the British. And I go, so listen, we're in India. Where's the yogis? And they go, well, we're not into yoga, but I know there's a free yoga class each morning at this football field. We call it soccer in America. Uh, gave us directions, be there at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, there's a yoga class. So next morning we get up, set our alarm clock, we're walking, and New Delhi still waking up, it's still cool, and hardly anybody on the street, and I see this naked guy walking down the street. It's not like he's a saint, he's just some beggar. Now, in America, if a naked person was walking down the street, everybody would be freaking out, calling the cops and all this. This person, everybody's get ignoring. They don't want to get involved with him, right? They're leaving him alone. India's got a billion people. Leave this out. Anyway, I go, that's cool. Nobody's getting this guy arrested. Anyway, we get to this uh, soccer field. There's already 40 people there. Most of them are gathered, sorted together. So we go over, check it up, and they... And they got this bucket of dirty water, and they got these rags in it. 
and they're swallowing the rags like Manji was talking about. And then the other people, they got these strings and they're sticking them in their nose and pulling them out their mouth and they're sharing all the stuff. <laughs> and, I'm, and I am scared to death of getting sick. I've just about been fasting all the way to India because I'm scared to eat anything except, you know, bananas and some cooked food and yogurt. Anyway, I go, oh my God, if this is yoga, I've made a big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, they don't demand that I do this. And then the Hatha Yoga part starts. Everybody gets out on the field, and it's like junior high school calisthenics. I go, oh, my God, I'm more advanced in yoga than they are. My, David, was, David Herndon was a really good teacher, the guy with the van. And so I go, okay, forget this. We're not coming back to this class. Start asking around again. Is there any, where's the yogis? Somebody else goes, Oh, there's this free class each morning at the YMCA Tourist Hostel. Go there. There's this Swami there. Next morning we go to that class. There's this beautiful guy with the orange clothes and long hair and long beard. And we do his class and we love it. And this guy, I just think he's great. And we go the next day and the next day. But as I'm doing yoga, I'm breathing more than I've ever breathed in my life. And it's the filthiest air I've ever breathed. And I'm going, oh my God, rather than yoga and extending my life, I'm going to die twice as fast if I'm breathing twice as much. <laughs> we got to get out of here. <clears throat> so, and I asked the Swami, I go, do you ever teach anywhere else? And he goes, no. And I go, well, if you ever do, here's my parents' address, write them. I'd really love to study with you, but I got to get out of New Delhi. Where to go? I feel like the yoga detective trying to follow the next clue to find yoga. I've read Autobiography of a Yoga by Paramahansa Yogananda, and he mentioned that he learned yoga in the town of Puri on the Bay of Bengal. It's one of the four holy cities of India. It's got the big Jagannath temple and its temples and ashram. We are just about out of money now. We buy two third-class train tickets from New Delhi all the way to Puri, $7 each. Third class sleeper. It's going to last three and a half days. <clears throat> our train doesn't leave till 11 p.m. We check out of our room at noon because we don't want to pay the seven cents more to stay in the room any longer. We're just hanging around, waiting to go to the train station. <clears throat> it's evening. We're sitting in Gaylord's restaurant on Connaught Place, drinking a cup of tea, which cost about a penny as slowly as possible so they don't make us go out. I look out the window and I see this guy waving is all excited. It's John from the bus, the guy with the spiritual books that wore white clothes. <clears throat> and he goes, come on in. He comes, sits with you. I'm so happy to find you. I've been looking all over for you. And I go, well, here we are. And he goes, we got separated when we got here. So what are you doing? And I said, well, uh, I said, I said what you, so what you doing? He goes, tomorrow morning, I'm going to walk out of New Delhi. I'm not going to ride a bus, take a train. I'm just going to walk into India. When the student's ready, the teacher appears. And I said, well, I got about the same plan, except I got a $7 train ticket. And he said, well, that's why I wanted to find you. I realized that I have more money than I need, whereas you have less money then you need, and I want to give you this, and hands us a whole stack of rupees, enough to live for months. Hallelujah. <laughs> we, we won the lottery. Say goodbye to John. Never seen him again since. I'd love to thank him. Anyway, off we go. We take the train to Puri. We're going along, and um, I get up in the morning, and we're on third-class sleeper. I start doing yoga on my bunk because I can't miss, you know. And this Indian guy's on there, and he, he sees I'm doing yoga and gets on the floor, and he does peacock just perfect and asks me if I can do it, and I do it. And he goes, my brother's a yogi. He went crazy. <laughs> and I, I remember that. Anyway, um, we get to Puri. Um, we find this great little uh, hotel, uh, Sea View Hotel, a little about out of town, across from the beach get a fabulous room with a fan and mosquito net for like seven, eight cents a night. It's there, you go get a tolly meal, all you can eat for a dime. You could live really good for like 30 cents a day, you know. And so I'm here, now I gotta find the guru. So we, 
we walk down the beach and we get up, do our yoga, walk to town, go find the Yogananda Center, Yogananda Ashram. Uh, a nice boy with clean white clothes and speaks English, greets us, say, we've come to learn yoga. And he goes, all the classes here in Orissa, nobody speaks English. Uh, maybe, and, and then this old man comes over and he's, a renun he's, he's reached the fourth stage of life where he's become a yogi, you know, left his family to die and his life of yoga. So he's got the long hair, long beard, orange clothes, speaks perfect English, and he befriends us, says, I'll help you, let's walk around. I know some other places that might have yoga class. And we walk around with the guy, and we're talking, and we go from place to place, and there's no yoga being taught in, in, in English. But the guy's really nice. He takes us to the temple. Because we're not Hindus, we can't get in, but shows us a place where there's a roof you can look in, see the Jagannath temple. And he says something I remember now 43 years later. He told me, the first 10 years of yoga is pre-yoga. It's just getting in shape for the real yoga. And I go, well, that makes sense. If I'm going to levitate, it's probably going to take more than a few months. And I go, that, that's fine with me. I have given my life to yoga. They say that Shiva takes care of his own. Here I am. I'm in India. Just now i got to find a guru. And so he says, well, if this doesn't work out, go down to Pondicherry. The people at the Yogananda Ashram say, uh, go up to our center in Ranchi, Bihar, uh, because that woman Mataji, her pictures in Autobiography of a Yogi, blonde hair, sort of his first American disciple, she's living up there in her old age. She teaches yoga in English. We take the train, go up there. We go to buy our train tickets, and then it starts to rain. It rains torrentially for five days. I looked this up to make sure it was true. This was the, the cyclone of October 1971. Five or ten million people were killed in this, and this holy city was in the eye of it. We survived. The, thing, the rain finally ends. The water goes down. We have to wait a few days to repair a bridge. We go to Ranchi. Get up, and it's the dirtiest place I've ever been, and we're staying in a funky hotel because we still are hoarding our money. Go to the ashram next morning, figuring class will be at 6 a.m. Show up. The, play, the old woman has died. The place is closed down for remodeling and painting. Sorry. Okay. The yogi that told me the first 10 years of yoga is pre-yoga said, if nothing pans out, go south to Pondicherry. There is the biggest ashram in India, or a bindo ashram. I know there's a lot of foreigners there. What he didn't know, they were French. And my French in school was so bad. Anyway, we take the train, get to Pondicherry, go to the reception. They welcome us, give us a beautiful room. It's all free. Uh, give us a room, tell us it's three meals a day and tea at four o'clock, and that we can use the library. There's meetings at night, and it sounds great. And I go, when's yoga class? And they go, oh, we do karma yoga. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, all the young people here are starting to build Oroville, uh, Orobindo's idea of utopian society. Anyway, they give us a room for a month, but at the end of 30 days, we have to make a decision. We can either, one, leave, or two, give them everything we own, we'll ever inherit, and stay for the rest of our life. But they're going to put me to work as a carpenter, a farmer, something, no yoga. And so I'm going... Shit, I could have been a farmer in North Carolina, you know, uh, or what, you know, carpenter. And so every day we're practicing yoga twice a day in our room. We go to the beach, and um, I see a guy body surfing, and he comes in, and I thought I knew how to body surf. This guy was really good, and he tells me he's from Kauai and had lived in the commune Taylor's Ranch, I mean, Taylor's, Taylor's Camp in Kauai, uh, owned by Elizabeth Taylor's brother, son, brother. It, it was a total hippie commune on the island of Kauai, Hawaii. They had a naked store, naked surfing, you know, just the new age capital of Hawaii. So that's how I first heard about Hawaii. Anyway, my, I don't know what to do. I got my book Integral Yoga Hatha by Swami Satchitananda. And I've written to Sri Lanka where he was. 
I've gone all over India, can't find yoga anywhere. Should I come down there to learn yoga? Please write me back, post restaurant, general delivery. And, um, and so I'm waiting for the reply. I go to the post office every day. Finally, like on the 29th day, I get a letter. Dear David, if you want to learn yoga, don't come here. We just have one class on Friday, Saturday morning and it's a bunch of misbehaving kids. But if you're in Pondicherry, go meet Dr. Swami Geetananda at Ananda Ashram. He has a six-month teacher training course and uh, it should be starting about now. And so I've got this letter in my pocket and um, I go in this bookstore just to get out of the sun, figure out what to do. They got a bookshelf with a few books on yoga in English. I see this one, 99 classical pranayamas. 99? I thought there's about 10. So I open it up, I'm looking at it, and the author is Dr. Swami Geetananda, Ananda Ashram. I pull out my letter, same guy. It's got the address of the place. I take it up to the cashier, uh, how far away is this place? And he goes, oh, just a kilometer out of town. You can take a rickshaw. I'm so cheap, I don't buy the book. Anyway, get in a rickshaw, <laughs> go out there. It's, this, it's sort of a big field, sort of like a setback. I go up, it's this orange building, orange wall, because yoga's the orange, orange yoga color. Go up, and two girls greet us. And I go, is this the ashram? And they go, yeah. And I go, is the Swami here? And they, yeah, come on in. And uh, they say, do you want to meet the Swami? And I go, please. And they go, hold on. They run upstairs to his bedroom area, and they come back and go, okay, you can see the Swami. We go up, I meet this Swami. He's 60 years old, he's a retired medical doctor, he says. I wondered afterwards, because later I caught him in so many lies. But anyhow, um, he, he said, we have this full program, six month teacher training course, you get a certificate at the end. We teach all this stuff, and we teach yoga chikitsa. And I go, what's yoga chikitsa? And he goes, Miriam, come in here. This big Austrian girl comes in, lays a mat on the floor, tells me to lay down. I lay down, she starts walking on my back, cracking my back, just like in the Turkish bath. And I go, do you teach this? And he goes, oh yes, yeah, part of yoga, yoga chikitsa. And I go, sign me up. And so we sign up for the teacher training. We stay for the next six months. About in the last month, the teacher says, got a special treat for you this afternoon. We have a great treat. The son of a great Hatha yoga master is coming to do a demonstration. Okay, so the afternoon class starts and uh, K.P. Manju and his friend Basaraju bust out first series just like we did this morning. I see this, it's like a comic book with the light goes on. I go, this is what I came to India to learn. When they finish, thank goodness they speak English, I go up, start talking to Manju, and like I said that night, I'm your new student. Um, teach me yoga. He goes, yeah, take me to America. I'll teach you yoga. And I go, if that's what it takes, I will. But in the meantime, and he tells me about his father. Now, my visa is about to expire, so I can't go immediately. I have to leave the country. It's not like America where they just drag it on. If you don't leave after six months, you get put in jail. Okay, so we're totally out of money. Um, I written my parents, asked them to send $600 to the American Express office in Bombay. Debbie did the same thing, had her parents send $600. And, um, but her parents are trying to get her away from me. Like, I'm, <laughs> she's been gone now like almost a year. I'm the devil. Uh, so uh, um, they have said that they want her to fly to Rome and meet them and they're gonna ho have a holiday and don't bring me along. Anyway. So I tell my parents, send me money, I'll get some charter flights, come home, I'll work and pay you back, I want to be honorable, which I did. Um, she returns to New York, I go to North Carolina, um, all I want to do now is work and make money as fast as I can to get back to India. The first day I'm back, my parents tell me there's a couple down the street that want to hear about India. I go over their house, um, they're asking me about it, they go, will you teach us yoga. And they say, what's your dream? And I go, I just want to get back to India. The man goes, well, I have this fashion company. I need somebody for this job of making the samples for the salesman for the next four months. In four months, you can earn $3,000, enough for another year in India. In exchange, will you teach us yoga once a week? 
great idea. So every Monday I teach them yoga. My grandmother comes, one of my sisters comes, and um, I have my money together. While I'm doing this, I meet an older lady in town who has some yoga classes going. She meets me. She wants to just have me teach her and all her students. And I go, but I don't know about the money. In India, if you ask for money for yoga, you're a charlatan. She goes, don't worry. Uh, I'll take care of the money. You just teach us, and I'll occasionally give you some money. Can you handle that? No problem. Okay, we do this. One of her students, uh, I do this, and uh, one of her students is a professor at Wofford College in Spartanburg, South Carolina. He tells me, we have this interim course in February. Would you like to be a college professor for a month and teach the theory and practice of Ashtanga Yoga, and you'll make a few thousand dollars, you know, professor's pay? And I go, okay, why not? So in between, uh, my four-month job finished with this guy. One of my, another girl I met is opening a record store for Columbia Records near the university. She goes, want to work in a record store for a little bit till I get it opened? I love, I'd love to work in a music store. So um, I take this job. The first day I go into work, she has another friend coming up from Key West who she's offered a job, Nancy Gilgoff. Uh, they were in university together at Syracuse. I meet her, we hit it off. She doesn't know anybody. She's never been to Greensboro before. She's just coming in from Key West. She's from Washington, D.C. in New York. It's Labor Day weekend coming up. I want to go to the beach, see all my friends, you know, all my old lifeguard friends. I feel bad for her. She doesn't know anybody. And the couple, she's staying with Meryl and Dennis, and they have an infant, and, you know, so I go, Want to go to the beach with me? Sure. So we pack up, head to South Carolina, and stay with my friend Bobby Hubbard. And I'm, okay, left out this part. Where about Debbie? <laughs> okay. I, now this is the time where telephone calls are still expensive. Debbie and I are writing each other all the time. I get a, a phone call from Debbie. David, all our problems are over. And I go, what do you mean? And she goes, remember Jeffrey, one of the two guys we went? And I go, sure. And she goes, well, Jeffrey's grandfather told him that the day he married a Jewish girl, he would give him $1 million in cash. If he married anybody else, he wouldn't get it. If he died first, he wouldn't get it. He wants to be at Jeffrey's wedding, you know, settle him down and all this, whatever. So Jeffrey called me up and said he'd give me $500,000 if I married him. And I go, that's great. What about me? And he goes, Jeffrey knows about you. Don't worry. And I go, well, I am a little worried. How's this work? Like, am I going to be invited to the wedding? Are the three of us going together on the honeymoon? Um, and I go, this is not right. I don't need to defraud this old man to get this money. Shiva's going to take care of me. This, I don't want to participate in this fraud. And she goes, I'll never get another chance like this. Are you in or out? And I go, I'm out. She goes, I'm in. And I never saw her again. Aww. So, yeah, you know, it's not happening to you. It's happening for you. I, that's one of my mottos in life. Anyway, so I meet Nancy. It's like a month later. Say you want to go to the beach. She's sort of getting over breaking up with her boyfriend, Richie. And so we go to the beach. The old thing from, you know, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. <laughs> we fall in. I start teaching her yoga. We are, we are really got a lot in common, and everybody else in North Carolina might as well be from another planet. So um, I'm saving my money for India. She says she wants to go to India with me. I go, okay, but you got to save your own money. I don't have enough for both of us. And she goes, no problem. I'll keep working for Merrill. So um, I do the college class in February, but we don't want to arrive in India till fall, you know, because you want to be there in the winter when it's cooler. We decide we'll go back to Coconut Grove, where they had the yoga in the park and is a cool place. And we go down there, not knowing what to expect. We buy a Volkswagen van that we can camp in pull into Coconut Grove, go to the health food store. There's a sign, room for rent, some amount, less than 100 bucks a month. We go by. It's this commune uh, sort of run by one of the guys who produced Woodstock. And we get a room with all these far-out people and start living there, and it's really fun. 
And someone says that I should go visit my neighbor three doors away, this woman Eve Diskin. Eve Diskin was said to be the first person who made a million dollars on yoga. She had uh, published yoga books, Yoga for Americans, Yoga for Everyone. On the cover, she's got a doing spinal twist with this blonde bouffant hairdo and all. Anyway, I meet Eve. She is really nice and she is in a sad state. She has been in love with, her lover is this guy, Dr. Eugene Rawls, a doctor of endology at University of Miami who's di recently died of cancer. This stunned her. She thought he was such a great yogi he'd lived to 108 or whatever, you know. She goes, this is so great to meet you. I have so many people want to learn yoga. I can't handle it. I'll put you to work. You can teach as much yoga as you want. Um, so she starts sending me over to the Fountain Blow Hotel the Miami, in Miami, in the Doral, the two nicest hotels in Miami Beach, setting me up with privates every day with rich women living by the golf course. Suddenly, I'm making $35 an hour and getting lunch for doing yoga with these nice middle-aged ladies, and I'm like 24. And, and suddenly, it's not bothering me too much to accept money for yoga. This is okay, you know, because I've got, keep your eyes on the prize. I want to get in India with, with uh, as much money as I can. So we stay in um, Miami until summer comes, sell the van, get another, uh, charter flight from New York. I find it in the paper or something. Hitchhike up to New York. Fly to, where do we fly on this? Fly to Gatwick on that one. Hitchhike to the channel. Take the ferry. Hitchhike across Europe in four days. I don't want to spend any time. I want to get to India, not spend my money. Take another one of the magic buses. Get to India. We have a plan to meet one of my, a friend I'd met in Miami named George, who was like the most advanced yoga guy there other than me. His family was Greek. His parents were taking him home to Greece to meet the relatives that summer. So afterwards, he decided he'd meet us in India. George uh, hitchhiked to India. He didn't take one of these bus. He rode like with truck drivers, got in fights and brothels and all kinds of scene. His stories were amazing. Anyway, we... We initially go to Pondicherry because Geetnanda, when I left, has promised me that I'm his new star and do one more year with me and he's going to put me to work sending me to teaching yoga centers all over the world and racka racka. We get back to uh, Pondicherry and everything's changed. His, he had, one of his senior students is pregnant. Uh, he, they're all stressed out. Uh, they, He's accusing this Swiss guy of stealing from the ashram, and he beats the guy up. This is not ahimsa. I go, I go, this is not the yoga teacher I want, you know, beating up the students. I'm scared he's going to beat me up if I tell him I'm leaving because I'm like his putting, investing all this energy teaching me. So we sneak out in the middle of the night. Uh, we tell George we're going to Mysore. I've still got Guruji's name and address. And, um, and, George has found out about some guru in North India that's into putting tubes in his nose, tubes up his penis, sucking up, you know, water, ghee, mercury, by doing Nali Kriya, all these occult practices. So George is going for this guru. We agree that we'll meet in Rishikesh uh, in North India. Uh, Nancy and I go to Mysore, as I told you, I meet Guruji. He accepts us as students, tells me he's going to, teach us this 5,000 year old practice. I start learning it. Uh, we copy down the syllabus of the wall on the wall, which I've, later students of mine, 30 years later, made the poster. So Guruji's teaching us. We can go as fast as our memory can go. As soon as we learn first series, we learn second series. Well, I'm going faster than Nancy. But as soon as I learn second series, he teaches the pranayama. We're doing that every day. Then practice again in the afternoon. So my morning and afternoon practice is two and a half hours. I'm doing elementary, intermediate, half advanced day. Two and a half hours. Rest, pranayama. Eat lunch, siesta, go back, practice again. My practice is up to five and a half hours a day. My visa is about to expire. And um, so I go, 
Karuchi, what do I do? My train's tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. If I do all my yoga, I'll, I'll have to stay up all night. And he goes, no, just do the daily minimum. And I go, what's the daily minimum? And he said, three of the first salutation of the sun, three of the second salutation of the sun, and the three finishing postures. If you do just that much, you won't backslide. And I don't know where he got that word from. And um, <laughs> the next day, if you have more time, you can go on. And so when I say I haven't missed in 43 years, I hadn't done everything I know every day, but I do at least the daily minimum. I've mentioned that. Anyway, so I do the daily minimum. We get on the train and go north. We're supposed to meet George in Rishikesh, where the Beatles went and met Mahara Maharishi, you know, the, the yoga town of India. We get to Rishikesh. We, well, we get to New Delhi, then we take buses for six hours to Rishikesh. We finally get there. We are so hot, so tired, don't know what to do. We, the bus lets us out at Shivananda Ashram, the biggest ashram up there. It's on the Ganges River. We sort of just walk through and down the bathing gats, the concrete steps down to the river. I bought a papaya. We carry some a knife with us and some spoons. So we're sitting down, getting ready to eat the papaya. Up comes this elderly Swami with the orange clothes. He had shaved head, not the dreadlocks. And he goes, what are you? He speaks perfect English, the king's English. He goes, very British sound. He goes, what are you doing? You can't just eat here like common people. Come up to my couture, my apartment, and um, I'll give you a plate and you can eat there. And we go, okay, sure. So we follow this guy up. He has this little apartment overlooking the Ganges. And the story is he was a minister for Nehru. His job was that he screened all the mail that came in. One day they got a box of yoga books from Shivananda. He went and read them. And after that, he, he took his holiday, went up to Shivananda Ashram, decided he was going to retire and for the rest of his life be a yogi. Shivananda told him he, if he spent his money and built an apartment, he could live there, and then when he died, it became part of the ashram. So he's living there. We eat our papaya. He tells us that, um, he'll, he says, here, put on some orange clothes so you don't get your clothes wet, and go bathe in the Ganges. When you first arrive, you must bathe in the Ganges and wash away your sins. So we go, fine. So uh, he gives us some orange shirt and drawstring shorts. He has one of those screens that you saw. He had all these clothes hanging on it for Nancy to get behind and change clothes. I just sort of get over the side, take off my clothes and they're changing. He looks at me and you can see he's astonished. He goes, you have a bush. And I go, yeah. And then he goes, does she have a bush too? <laughs> and I go, well, yeah. And he goes, well, here, let me give you a razor. And I go, I'm not going to shave. And you go, what do you mean? He's like totally grossed out that we're not shaving because everybody there, because of lice, they always stay shaved, you know, and it's just what the look he's used to. And he go, I couldn't even have sex with my wife if I didn't shave her first and all this. And I go, forget it. We are not doing this. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it's a funny story I remember. We go down, bathe in the Ganges, come back up, and he goes, I've got you a room to stay in. And I go, really? And he go, yeah, it's the best suite in the place. It's the room that, my, that Mrs. Gandhi stayed in when she was here. And I go, why are you being so nice to us? And he goes, I looked down, I saw Miss Nancy, and I thought for sure it's my mother reincarnated, and I must serve my mother. And so he's decided he's going to serve us. Whoa, okay. So he checks us into our big nice room, tells us when the meals are. He goes, you don't even have to go to the cafeteria. We'll have, I can have food brought to your room. And I go, no, we want to go meet all the yogis. This is social time. They have asana class in the morning, asana class in the evening, meditation. You know, good schedule for practicing yoga. Then I go, I forgot George. Um, because we're supposed to meet. I go down to the office to look for him and run into him on the way. And, and we're all happy, hug each other. I remember George had a, a hand, we call him a hand of bananas that he just bought. And uh, I said, how long you been here? And I, he goes, two days. And I go, we just got this amazing, huge room. Where are you still? And he goes, oh my God, I'm in the men's dormitory. I hadn't slept in two nights. These guys are up all night talking, sneezing, coughing, smoking beaties. I can't get a bit of sleep. And I go, well, let's get your stuff and you can move in with us. 
we go over to the men's dormitory. Now, I know there's monkeys around. And so we go in his room, and he takes off his shoes. I know not to do that, but I don't think to tell George. I carry my shoes in. He gets his belongings. He comes back out. One of his shoes is gone. And then we hear this chattering in the tree right out from the balcony. We're on the second floor. There's this monkey, and it's chattering and yelling at George and holding up his shoe. <laughs> this monkey is so smart, he communicated to George that George had to give him the bananas to get his shoe. They get up like this, like this. George grabs the shoe. The monkey grabs the bananas, and the deal is done. <laughs> anyway, um, George tells us that he's heard there, there's this great yogi here named Tatwala Baba. He's supposed to be the greatest living yogi. He lives in a cave on the other side of the Ganges. He meditates 23 hours a day. And every day from 10 to 11 a.m., he meets people. And um, we ask the Swami, and he goes, oh, yeah, this is the heaviest guy in Rishikesh. You've got to meet him. Um, Here's how you get there. Go up, cross Lakshmanjula Bridge, walk down to Maharishi Ashram, follow the path to the left of the wall. can't believe I remember this stuff. And follow the path, and you'll get to his cave. So the next morning, and he goes, Now, you can't go there empty-handed. When you visit a saint, you've got to bring a gift. And he told us to bring some food. So he told us to get a kilo of rice, a kilo of dal, a few things, you know. And so we go over there. We, um, we get up the hill, and there's a clearing. I see first a big blue tarp, and under it, there's a line of like 20 of the wildest looking characters. They've got dreadlocks to the ground. They've got ashes all over their body. They're wearing orange or loin cloths, and they're all eating lunch on banana skin. The situation was, anybody who comes to see Tatwala Baba brings food, and then twice a day he serves meals, and yogis living in caves above, this is the cafeteria for them. So these characters come down and eat, and um, so they're sustained, you know, and can do their practices in their cave. <clears throat> I look over, and on a little platform, cleared area, there is the most beautiful human I've ever seen. For an Indian, he's pretty big. His body is all shiny because he's got oil on it. He's, uh, he only wears a calpina, a little drawstring, all year. And if you put oil on it, it keeps you warm. I don't know if you know this part of live in a cave. Instead of clothes, you wear oil. Anyway, he has dreadlocks. Each one of them is like this big along, eight feet long. It's the biggest pile of hair I've ever seen in my life. Beautiful smile. I look at him and I go, man, this guy's really something. I guess... I'm like 25 by now. I think he's a little, a really healthy, maybe 38. Little do I know he's 79 years old. Wow. So I go sit down. Um, well, this, this little Indian guy who's his disciple is there. Nobody else is around. So he goes, come, sit, sit. Talk, talk to the, the, swan, the guru. And he wants us to ask questions for him to translate so he can hear how his guru answers, you know, and this is going to be his teachings for the day. So George and Nancy and I go over and we sit down in Lotus. And um, so the kid's going, ask him a question, ask him a question. And I can't think of anything. So George goes, um, even with all the stuff I've been doing with this Swami, with the tubes in my nose and stuff, I always have one nose that's more stopped up than the other. Uh, what's your advice? And he goes, go back in your life to the time before your nose was blocked and the answer will be revealed. I go, okay, that's a good answer. <laughs> then the kids again, ask him a question, ask him a question. And so I'm going, okay. I first say, I go, I've been practicing yoga for a few years. I've been learning Ashtanga yoga uh, in South India with this great master. I have enough to work on for the rest of my life. So I'm really not asking for more teachings. My life is full. I am asking for nothing. Nevertheless, as a big yogi, and me a little yogi, just looking at me, do you flash on something you want to tell me? He looks at me, he goes, yes, this Hatha yoga is nothing. Go get your belongings, come back, live with me in the cave, and I'll teach you the real yoga. My heart melts, oh my God, this guy has asked me to come live in the cave and he's going to teach me the real yoga. <laughs> This is the happiest day of my, the next happiest day of my life, you know. 
this is the real yoga. This is the cave guy, not like living in my apartment. My, you know. So I go, listen, my visa's about to expire. I, I'm, we're out of money. I got to leave. Can I get it together, come back? And he goes, get your affairs in order, come back, bring your stuff, live in the cave with you, me, and I'll teach you the real yoga. I leave there on cloud nine. I am so happy. Um, we go back to New Delhi, fly back to America to initially get started. Nancy t works at the record store a little. I um, teach a few yoga classes. As soon as we got a few hundred bucks, we decide that we'll go back to Miami where I can teach yoga and make a lot of money. She had had a job there as a cashier at Holiday Inn. But first, we were going to have an adventure. We love traveling. I'd been to India twice, never been to California. Nancy had her sister Stephanie living in Lucadia right by Encinitas. And so um, we hitchhike across America um, to visit Stephanie. We um, go down to the beach one afternoon, walking back. Uh, and Encinitas was where Swami Yogananda's uh, Self-Realization Fellowship is just a big ashram on the cliff. Below it, this surf spot's called Swami's, famous surf spot. We're walking back from the beach, and I see this sign, Robert Mormon's Academy of Karate, Yoga, and Kung Fu. And I go, well, that's interesting. I, so I walk in. There's the owner, Robert Mormon. We start talking, and he tells me that he's been doing, he's a black belt in karate for 25 years, but he's been into Yogananda for 10 years. There's no yoga classes around. So he had set up that for the next two weeks, each night, 7 o'clock, for 10 classes, he had 20 people signed up for yoga class. He goes, the teacher's just flaked out. You want to make some money? I can't believe the timing. Will you teach this class? And I go, sure, I'd like to meet the people interested in yoga here. I can use a little bread. So we show up that night and teach the class. And it's really fun. I like all the people. Brad and Sherry are there. Terry Jenkins is there. And, um, and I, I write Guruji a letter. Uh, Dear Guruji, um, I'm teaching yoga in California. This is cool. And our letters cross. I get a letter forwarded from my parents. Dear David, um, I'm 58 years old. I've never been anywhere. As a gift to a guru, will you send, start sending me some money so I can come to America? So I write back, yes, Guruji, I'll send you $15 a week in only 300 years. I can bring you whatever. <laughs> Tell the class, I told you this part, they say, get him to come. Um, we, uh, it takes, mind you, seven months to get the visa. But in that time, I've, I've got all these really healthy, advanced students. Paul Dunaway, David Swenson, 15 years old, starts class. By the time Grigi gets there, we have about 26, 28 people ready to go. We go down, pick them up at the airport. They come through customs. Guruji's scared. He goes, uh, this is my son, Swami, uh, pointing to Manju. Manju goes, my name is not Swami. My name is Manju. We've come here to break your backs. And we all, <laughs> we all laugh, take them home. The next day, uh, uh, we start, uh, well, um, that night, We've set it up there. They'll start teaching like on a Sunday or something, beginning of the week, like they were talking, like Darby was saying, you know, and got to have at least three days. So I have just a, a Hatha yoga class set up at Mormons that I taught like Tuesday and Thursday night. I wasn't teaching the Ashtanga because I had sworn to Guruji I'd keep the method that everybody had to do the 30 day commitment or they couldn't do it. Now, David Swenson, Paul, Brad, and Sherry, all my really good students, they had made the 30-day commitment to me, and every morning at 7 a.m., I'm teaching the Ashtanga, getting ready for Guruji to come. But to make a little money, I have just Hatha Yoga class Thursday night and Tuesday night. So I take Guruji down to class with me, um, and he watches the class, and afterwards, I go, so Guruji, what'd you think? And he goes, very good for the teacher. And I go, huh? And he goes, yes, this is great. Look at you. You don't work. You do get to do yoga all morning. You come down here, make money. But for these people, this is no good. They'll get old before they get well. 
this method is too weak. And I remember that thing, they'll get old before they get well. This yoga is not strong like Ashtanga yoga. He goes, he, in a way, he, I don't know how he said it, but basically he let me know, you're sort of misleading these people because they think if they look at you and see how healthy you are and they think, oh, he does yoga. If I do yoga, I'll be this way. But they don't know what you're really doing. You're doing a lot more yoga than they're doing on Tuesday, Thursday night. And it just, bong, he's right. I tell them all that story and I go, listen, in good consciousness, I can't teach you this weak yoga anymore. It, these classes are suspended. You can either sign up for the 30-day commitment and start with Guruji or but whatever, this is over. Most of them signed up. And so for the next four months, Guruji and Manju stayed. I learned the rest of Advanced A and a half of Advanced B. Like I mentioned, Manju wants to stay. I've heard about Maui. Um, we're going to, um, I've given up this idea of going back to Miami because I'm staying in Encinitas waiting for Guruji to come. So we go to Maui. I don't know a soul. We, we don't have a place to stay. We're told there's a house we can leave our belongings under, but we can't stay there. But we can take a little knapsack to live off of and leave our major stuff under this house near the airport. So we do this. They tell me there's a health food store down to earth, down the street. So I go in there. I just yell out, and it's just a funky old place to go, anybody going to Lahaina? Because I heard Lahaina was great. It never rained there. And... Uh, you know, it's the cool place in Maui to be. And some kids go, yeah, we are. And so they had a van. They put us in. They're driving to Lahaina. And they go, where are you staying? And I go, we don't know. I guess camping out. And they go, listen, our family owns two condos. The adults are in one side. We're in the other. Wait till 9 o'clock tonight. They'll be in bed. Come in. You can sleep on the floor and leave before 7. Okay, great. We're sleeping indoors. Um, our friend Marcia, who... Uh, Danny mentioned was already there but she didn't have a place to uh, put us up she had met this guy that was the dr the bass player in Danny's band Carrie and because they played every night to 2 a.m. Marsha had the job of baby he was a single parent babysitting his daughter while Carrie played in the band with Danny and then she could crash there but it's this tiny place anyway we asked Marcia, where are you practicing yoga? And she goes, oh, I go to this park called the prison. It's this big walled-in park where the sailors, if they weren't offshore by sunset, they'd lock them up so they wouldn't get in trouble. Now it's just a park, grass on the ground, big mango trees for shade. We go in there the next morning to do yoga. And uh, I look back in the corner, and there's this guy, like Danny described, long hair, long beard, white clothes. And he's back in the corner on his straw mat doing yoga. It's Cliff Barber. I do third series or whatever. And uh, then when I'm through, I want to meet the yogi. So I go over, sit in Lotus in front of us. We namaste. And he goes, wow, what have you been doing? I've been practicing yoga 10 years. This is way more advanced than what I'm doing. And... Um, I said, well, it's called Ashtanga Yoga. I learned it from Patabi Joyce. And he goes, wow, will you teach me? And I go, well, I don't know. Because you're supposed to do this 30-day commitment. I don't even know if I'm going to be here for 30 days. And I'm thinking, I go, but I can see you're no beginner. And I think we can mut be mutually beneficial. I know you know the scene. Where's all the cool people? I know this is Maui. Where's all the cool people hang out? And he thinks a moment and he goes, you know what? There are hundreds, maybe a thousands of young people here camping at McKenna Beach and all over, ready to learn yoga, nobody to teach them. You do a yoga demonstration in three days, I'll pass the word around and everybody you want to meet will show up. I go, okay, that's what we do. Three days later, we go to the park. Marcia does first series, Nancy does second series, I do third series like a three ring circus. At the end, they're like, you know, and the local kung fu master, Roger Bacon, goes, wow, this would be good for my martial arts, will you teach me? And I'm, I go, well, I said I'd teach Cliff, come tomorrow, I'll teach you too. And somebody else says, can I come too? Sure, come. Next day, 39 people show up. The class is going. We teach them the salutations. Like I mentioned, I want it to be by donations. I'm not getting any money, hardly. After a couple months, I'm going, man, I've just about gone through my savings. i got to get back to India. 
um, and learn the last half of the last series. What if Guruji dies and it's gone, you know? So I get the class together. I go, listen, this donation business isn't working. The first day of each month, everybody has to approach me with a plain white envelope. I want to know whose envelope's whose. This is your honor system. But you've got to look me in the eye and go, this is for you teaching me yoga every day. Uh, this is my payment. I don't care if the envelope's empty. That's your conscience. But you've got to look me in the eyes and go, this is what I'm giving you for all the energy you've given me. And I got the $5 envelope, the $20 envelope. And the third month, we got a fat envelope with $3,000 in it. Two girls who owned an art gallery had a big sale, wanted to support our art. It was in Maui's best interest for me to learn the rest so I could come back and teach them. Now, this class is people from 11 different countries. And um, I want to keep the class going. It's a great scene. And I don't want it to end. Simultaneously, little David Swenson has graduated high school. He writes me a letter. Dear David, he's gone back to Texas. Uh, Y'all know the story about the short hair and all that, or if you don't, I'll tell you later. But anyway, um, he writes me, Dear David, I want to teach yoga, but nobody in Houston wants to learn yoga. What should I do? I go, jump on the next plane, come to Maui. Get to California. It's only 100 bucks. If you need it, I'll send you the money. And so he does this. He, within a few days, David is in Maui. For nine days, I teach him how to run an Ashtanga class. And um, off we go to, to India. We go directly to, to New Delhi, take the bus up to Rishikesh, go, because we're going to go to see Tatwala Baba and learn the real yoga, right? Um, so I get there to Swami Atmaramanandas, and he goes, wow, you're back so soon. I go, yeah, we've come to learn yoga from Tatwala Baba. And his face drops, and he goes, you don't know? And I go, what? And he goes, he was murdered. Every morning he would leave the cave at 6 a.m., bathe in the river. Some crazy came up, shot him in the back. And my heart drops. That, it was like the pen. This was the saddest moment of my life. Sometimes I start crying when I tell the story, but today I'm keeping it together. Anyway, uh, so we, we're just shocked. We, we leave the next day, go to Mysore. I learn the rest of Advanced B, and I am liberated. Finally, I know the whole thing. Hallelujah, Guruji didn't die. He lived to 93 years old, but I am free, you know. I, I don't need anything. I come back to Hawaii. Initially, all my students want to have class. Initially, I'm... Uh, I live with a rock and roll band in a commune and we do yoga together each morning and then they go in the studio to compose music, different stuff. By now, uh, Danny and all my more advanced people, they all move in. We're all living together. And um, then after six months, Nancy and I realize that we want to go different directions. Uh, we. We split our 400, and with all the money that came in from the yoga, I used to buy our food for, to feed the commune. And then the class was each morning, 7 a.m., I would do third or fourth series with Leah, and Danny and all his 10 helpers would teach 40 people first and second. Then when those people were finished, we'd go around, do the yoga chikitsa, crack all their backs. We're all learning the chiropractics, doing this on each other. And that's a whole other story because we had a guru of that that came into our lives, but another day, John Gilbert. Anyway, um, Nancy and I decide we're splitting up. My friend Roger Lewis wants to meet Guruji, so he goes, let's get out of here. Let's go to India so I can meet the guru. Um, so... Uh, People want to keep the yoga class going. Ten guys, some of the wealthier guys, each give $1,000. A guy named Harry gives a little piece. He had a big piece of land. He gave a little piece of land for the, yoga, the house of yoga and Zen so he didn't have to drive to class. And this is late 70s. We had the 30th anniversary a few years ago, House of Yoga and Zen. Everybody came together like an old barn raising with the $10,000. They built the 
the place and it's still going there. If you go to Maui, this is where Manju says, don't go to India, go to Maui to learn yoga, House of Yoga and Zen. It's where Manju will be teaching in the November. Anyway, um, I realized that I never wanted to be a yoga teacher. I wanted to be a yogi. I'm going to put this to the test. I hear this Shiva takes care of his own. Guruji saying, practice yoga, all is coming, you know, whatever. I, I tell my friend Charlie Butterfly, who um, I said, we want to move to Hana. Hana, they call the most Hawaiian place. It's surrounded by a national park for miles each direction, and then it's got this beach, a Hamoa beach. Michener said it's the most beautiful South Pacific beach in the North Pacific. Anyway, I called Charlie and go, I want to come to Hana. And he calls me back the next day, goes, call Neil right quick. There's a house by the ocean, $200 a month. Get it quick. We moved to Hana. Um, I start living there, uh, plant a garden. My rent's $200 a month and I continue in practicing twice a day. Like I said, I get up, swim a half mile in the ocean, do the pranayama, do, a, do my practice, eat lunch, do siesta, swim, practice, day after day, year after year. For 18 years, I, without missing, practice twice a day. Like I said, I went three years, I didn't even do first or second, thinking that'd be wimping out or something. Um, Guruji came to America, we flew over for that, like, um, um, Prem was talking about last night, and then come back. Um, from the years of 1981 to 2001, I never taught another group class. I just practiced twice a day. Occasionally I taught individuals. I made my money mainly doing body work because now I'd learned massage and the chiropractic yoga chikitsa stuff. Then um, in 2001, by now, Danny has been all over the world teaching workshops, traveled with Sting, Pearl Jam, taught Madonna, on and on. And every and David Swenson has got his book out. So he's getting invited every places. And wherever they taught, they mentioned that I had taught them. So these people would contact me, go, hey, want to come wherever and teach a workshop? So I go, sure, I like traveling. So now I've been to 66 countries. Um, I'm here in Bali this week. And from that group, in, in, in Tunisianist, but more from Lahaina, because the people from all over the world, 40 years ago, they left. They taught one, they taught one. This Ashtanga Yoga has no form. It's just been taught out of love to friends and spread and spread. And now it's all over the world. And that's how it got from a cave in Nepal to us here today. Aloha.